Chain Fire by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 320. Prelit, Berdine said as she pushed closed the door with a snake carved on it. Verna paused and waited as the woman tapped the palm of her hand on the top of the bronze skull door handle. What is it, Berdine? I think I should stay here. Stay? Verna met the Mord Sith's gaze. But why? If Anne finds Lord Rall and takes him to the army, he will have you and a number of other Mord Sith who are there to protect him, and he will be where you say he needs to be. But maybe she won't find him. She must. Richard is also aware of the weight of prophecy, and he knows that he must be there at the final battle. Even if Anne doesn't find him, I have faith that he will come to join us. Berdine shrugged with the difficulty of trying to find the right words. Maybe, but maybe not. Verna, I've spent a lot of time with him. He doesn't think like that. Prophecy doesn't mean as much to him as it does to you. Verna heaved a sigh. You said a mouthful, Berdine. This is Lord Raal's home, even if he never really lived here except as a captive. Even so, he has come to care about us as his people and his friends. I've spent time with him. I know how much he cares about us, and I know that he is aware of how much we all care about him. Maybe he will feel a need to come home. If he does, I think I should be here for him. He depends on me to help him with books, with translations. At least I like to believe he does. He makes me feel important to him anyway. I don't know, I just think I should remain at the palace in case he comes here. If he does, he will need to know that you are desperately trying to find him. He will need to know of the impending final battle. Does your bond tell you where he is? Berdine gestured west. Somewhere in that direction, but very distant. The general said the same thing. That can only mean that Richard is at least in the new world again. Verna found reason to smile. At long last. That much is good to know. The closer those with the bond are to him, the better able they will be to help you find him. Verna considered it a moment. Well, I will miss your company, Verdine, but I guess you must do as you see fit, and I have to admit that what you say does make some sense. The more places we watch for him to show up, the better our chances of finding him in time. I really think it's right for me to stay here. Besides, I want to study some of the books and try to match up some of what Kolo says. There are a few things bothering me. Maybe if I work it out, I can even help Lord Rao to win that final battle. Verna nodded with a sad smile. See me out? Of course. Both turned to the sound of footsteps. It was another moored Sith in red leather. She was blonde and taller than Berdine. Her piercing blue eyes took Verna in with the kind of measured calculation that betrayed utter fearless confidence. Nida, Berdine called. The woman smiled with one side of her mouth as she came to a halt. She placed a hand on Berdine's shoulder, a gesture that Verna recognized as being as close to wild jubilation as it got among Mord Sith, except perhaps for Berdine. Nida gazed down at Berdine, her eyes drinking her in. Sister Berdine, it has been a while. The Hara has been lonely without you. Welcome home. It's good to be home and see your face again. Nida's gaze slid to Verna. Berdine seemed to remember herself. Sister Nida, this is Verna, the prelate of the Sisters of the Light. She is a friend and advisor to Lord Raal. He is on his way here? No, unfortunately, Berdine said. Are you two sisters then? Verna asked. No, Berdine said, waving a hand at the notion. It's more like you calling the other women of your kind sister. Nida is an old friend. Nida glanced around. Where is Raina? Berdine's face went white at the unexpected encounter with the name. Her voice fell to a whisper. Raina died. 
Nida's face was unreadable. I didn't know, Berdine. Did she die well, with her aegeal in her hand? Berdine swallowed as she stared at the floor. She died of the plague. She fought it until her final breath, but in the end it took her. She died in Lord Raoul's arms. Verna thought that she could detect that Nida's blue eyes were just a little more liquid as she gazed at her sister Mord Sith. I'm so sorry, Berdine. Berdine looked up. Lord Raoul wept as she died. By the silent but astonished look on Nida's face, Verna could see that it was unheard of for the Lord Raoul to care if a Mord Sith lived or died. By the look of wonder that surfaced, such reverence for one of them was homage of profound proportions. I have heard such tales about this Lord Raoul. They are really true, then? Berdine smiled radiantly. They are true. Chapter 32 What are you reading that's so absorbing? Rika asked as she used a shoulder to push the thick door closed. Zed grunted with displeasure before glancing up from the book lying open before him. Blank pages. Through the round window to his left he could see the roofs of the city of Aidendril spread out far below. In the golden light of the setting sun the city looked beautiful, but that appearance was but an illusion. With all the people gone, fleeing for their lives before the hordes of invaders, the city was no more than an empty, lifeless husk, like the shed skin of the cicadas that had recently emerged. Rika leaned toward him over the magnificent polished desk and tilted her head to see better as she peered down at the book. It's not all blank, she announced. You can't read something that is blank, you therefore must be reading the writing, not the blank places. You should try to be more accurate in what you say, if not more honest. Zed's frown darkened as his gaze rose to meet hers. Sometimes what isn't said is more meaningful than what is said. Did you ever think about that? Are you asking me to keep quiet? She set down a large wooden bowl containing his dinner. The steam drifting up carried the aroma of onions, garlic, vegetables, and succulent meat. It smelled distractingly delicious. No, demanding it. Through the round window to his right, Zed could see the dark walls of the keep soaring high up overhead. Built into the side of the mountain that overlooked Aidendril, the wizard's keep was nearly a mountain itself. Like the city, it too was empty, with the exception of Rika, Chase, Rachel, and himself. It wouldn't be long, though, before there would be more people in the keep. At last, the keep would once again have a family living in it. The empty halls would again ring with laughter and love, as they once had when countless people called the keep home. Rika contented herself with gazing around at the shelves in the round turret room. They were filled with jars and jugs in a variety of shapes and delicately colored glass vessels, some filled with ingredients for spells, and in one case, polish for the desk. The ornately carved straight-backed oak chair, the low chest beside his chair, and the bookcases. Books in a variety of languages filled most of the space on the shelves. The corner cases with glassed doors held more of the tomes. Rika folded her arms as she leaned close and studied some of the gilded spines. Have you actually read all these books? Of course, Zed muttered, many times. It must be boring being a wizard, she said. You have to do too much reading and thinking. It's easier to get answers by making people bleed. Zed harumphed. When a person is in agony, they may be eager to talk but they tend to tell you what they think you want to hear, whether it's true or not. She pulled out a volume and thumbed through it before replacing it on the shelf. That is why we are trained to question people by using the proper methods. We show them how very much more painful it is for them when they lie to us. If they understand the profoundly terrible consequences of lying, people will tell the truth. Zed wasn't really listening to her. He was concentrating on trying to figure out what the fragment of prophecy could mean. 
Every single possibility he came up with only served to further ruin his appetite. The steaming bowl sat waiting. He realized that she was probably hanging around waiting for him to comment on dinner. Maybe she was waiting for a compliment. So, what's to eat? Stew. Zed stretched his neck a bit to glance in the wooden bowl. Where's the biscuits? No biscuits, stew. I know stew, I can see that it's stew. What I mean is, where are the biscuits to go with the stew? Rika shrugged. I can get you some fresh bread if you'd like. It's stew, he exclaimed with a scowl. Stew calls for real biscuits, not bread. If I had known you wanted biscuits for dinner, I could have made you biscuits rather than the stew. You should have said something earlier. I don't want biscuits instead of stew, Zed growled. You change your mind a lot when you're grumpy, don't you? Zed squinted at her with one eye. You really are talented at torture. She smiled, turned on a heel, and strode regally out of the small room. Zed thought that Mord Sith must strut even when they were alone. He went back to the book, trying to come at the problem from a different angle. He had only had time to read the passage again a couple of times when the latch on the door lifted and Rachel shuffled into the room carrying something in both hands. She used her foot to push the door closed. Zed, you should put your book away now and have some supper. Zed smiled at the child. She always made him smile. She was infectious that way. What have you got there, Rachel? She reached up and set the tin bowl on the desk then stretched her arm out as she pushed it across the desk toward him. Biscuits! Flabbergasted, Zed rose up a little from his chair to lean over and look in the tin bowl. What are you doing with biscuits? Rachel's big eyes blinked at him as if it were the strangest question she had ever heard. They're for your supper. Rika asked me to carry them for her. She had her hands full with a bowl of stew for you and one for Chase. You shouldn't help that woman, Zed said with a menacing scowl as he sat back down. She's evil. Rachel giggled. You're silly, Zed. Rika tells me stories about the stars. She makes pictures out of them and then tells a story about each picture. Is that so? Well, sounds like a nice thing for her to do. With the light fading, it was getting hard to read. Zed cast out a hand, sending a spark of his gift into the dozens of candles in the elaborate iron candelabrum. The warm light brightened the cozy little room, lighting the finely fit stone of the walls and the heavy oak beams across the ceiling. Rachel grinned, her eyes glistening with both reflected points of candlelight and with wonder. She liked seeing him light candles. You have the bestest magic, Zed, Zed sighed. I wish you weren't leaving me, little one. Rika doesn't appreciate my candle lighting trick. You will miss me? No, not really. I just don't want to be left alone with Rika, he said, as he read the last bit again. They will at first contest him before they plot to heal him. What could that mean? Maybe you could get Rika to tell you some stories about the stars. Rachel began looking sad as she came around the desk. I'll miss you something awful, Zed. Zed looked up from the book. Rachel held her arms out, wanting a hug. A smile overcame him as he scooped her into his arms. There were few things in life that felt as good as a hug from Rachel. She was a devotee of the hug, never putting less than her full enthusiasm into it. You have good hugs, Zed. Richard has good hugs, too. Yes, he does. Zed remembered being in that very room so long ago when his own daughter was about the same age as Rachel. She too would come to see him and want a hug. Now all that he had left was Richard. Zed missed him terribly. I will miss you, little one. But before you know it, you will be back here with the rest of your family. And then you will have brothers and sisters to play with instead of just an old man. Zed sat her on his knee. It will be good to have all of you at the wizard's keep with me. The keep will be a joyous place, what with life in it again. Rika said that she will never have to cook again once my mother comes here. 
Zed took a sip of lukewarm tea from a pewter mug on the chest beside him. Did she now? Rachel nodded, and she said that my mother would probably make you brush your hair. She held out her hands, wanting to share a drink from his mug. He let her gulp tea. Zed cocked his head. Brush my hair? Rachel nodded with a serious look. It sticks all out, but I like it. Rachel, Chase said as he ducked in through the round-topped doorway. Are you bothering Zed again? Rachel shook her head. I brought him biscuits. Rika said he likes biscuits with his stew, and I should bring him a whole bowl full. Chase planted his fists on his hips. And how is he supposed to eat his biscuits with ugly children sitting on his lap? You could scare his appetite right out of him. Rachel giggled as she hopped down. Zed glanced at the book again. Are you all packed up? Yes, the big man said. I want to get an early start. We'll leave first thing in the morning if that's still all right with you. Zed dismissed the concern with a wave of his hand as he studied the prophecy. Yes, yes, the sooner you get your family back here, the better. We'll all feel better having them here where we know they will be safe and you will all be together. Chase's heavy brow drew lower over his intent brown eyes. Zed, what's the matter? What's wrong? Zed looked up with a frown. Wrong? Nothing. Nothing is wrong. He's just busy reading, Rachel assured Chase as she hugged his leg and put her head against his hip. Zed, Chase said in a demanding drawl that said he didn't believe a word of it. What makes you think something is wrong? You haven't eaten a thing. Chase rested one hand on the wooden handle of a long knife at his belt and with the other caressed Rachel's head of long golden blonde hair. The man probably had a dozen knives of various sizes strapped around his waist and to his legs. When he left in the morning, he would add swords and axes to the knives. That can only mean something is wrong. Zed popped a biscuit in his mouth. There, he mumbled around the mouthful. Satisfied? While Zed chewed the warm biscuit, Chase leaned down and lifted the girl's chin. Rachel, go to your room and finish getting your things packed up. And I expect your knives to be cleaned and sharp as well. She nodded earnestly. They will be, Chase. Rachel had had a hard life for one so young. For reasons that had always made Zed suspicious, she'd been at the center of a variety of consequential situations. When Chase had taken the orphaned girl in to raise as his own daughter, Zed himself had admonished the man to teach her to protect herself, to teach her to be like him so that she could defend herself and stay safe. Rachel adored Chase and eagerly learned all the lessons he taught her. With one of the smaller knives she carried, she could pin a fly to a fence post at 10 paces. And I want you in bed early so that you will be well rested, Chase told her. I'm not carrying you if you're tired. Rachel gave him a puzzled look. You carry me when I tell you I'm not tired. Chase cast Zed a pained look before giving her a clearly feigned scowl. Well, tomorrow you're just going to have to keep up on your own. Rachel nodded seriously, unruffled by the man towering over her. I will, she looked at Zed. Will you come and kiss me good night? Of course, Zed said with a smile of his own. I'll be in after a bit to tuck you in. He wondered if Rika would stop by her room to tell her a story. It was heartwarming to think of the moored Sith telling a child stories about pictures made by the stars in the sky. Rachel seemed to have that effect on everyone. Chase watched through the doorway as his daughter raced off down the broad rampart. Zed had been gratified at the way she had taken to the wizard's keep. In short order, she had made it hers and was happily skipping through halls that were thousands of years old. She minded well and never strayed from the areas Zed had warned her about. She was a child who understood danger. Out on the rampart, she looked completely at ease as she paused momentarily to gaze through a crenellation down at the city below before racing off again. It seemed to Zed a wonder that such spindly legs could carry the child so swiftly. After Chase was sure that she was safely on her way, 
He closed the heavy oak door and stepped closer to the desk. His size made the cozy room, a room that Zed had always thought quite comfortable, seem rather cramped. Now, what's the problem? The man wasn't going to be satisfied until he knew more. Zed sighed and used a finger to spin the book around for the boundary warden to read. Take a look, you tell me. Chase glanced at the ancient book. He lifted a page to each side and briefly took a look before setting each page back down. Like I said, what's the problem? It doesn't look like there is much here to worry about. Zed arched an eyebrow. That's the problem. What do you mean? It's a book of prophecy. It's supposed to have writing in it. Prophecy. You can't have a book with no writing and have it still be a proper book, now can you? The writing is gone. Gone? Chase scratched a graying temple. That doesn't make any sense. How can writing be gone? It's not like someone could steal the words right off the page. That was an interesting way to look at it, that someone had stolen the words right off the page. Having been a boundary warden most of his life, until the boundary came down a few years back, Chase was the kind of man who would suspect theft before anything else. Zed hadn't considered that possibility. His mind was already rushing down the unexplored dark alley of deliberation. I don't know how the words could be gone, he confided as he took a sip of tea. What is the prophecy about? Chase asked. This happens to be a book of prophecy mostly about Richard. Chase looked completely calm, which of course meant that he was anything but. Are you certain it used to have writing in it? He asked. If it's old, maybe you just forgot that it had blank pages. After all, when you read a book, you tend to recall the writing, not the blank pages. True enough, he set the pewter mug aside. I can't swear for certain that I remember it having writing in it but I just don't believe it was ever mostly blank. Now it is. Chase's expression didn't betray his feelings as he considered the mystery. Well, I admit that it does sound strange, but is it really a problem? Richard never was one for prophecy. He wouldn't have heeded them anyway. Zed rose up and stabbed a finger at the book, tapping insistently. Chase, this book has been here in the keep for thousands of years. For thousands of years, it's had writing, prophecy in it. I'm sure of it. Now it's suddenly blank. Does that sound trivial to you? Chase shrugged as he hooked his thumbs in his back pockets. I don't know, Zed. I'm no expert in such things. I think the day that you have to come to me for answers about books of prophecy is the day you're in big trouble. You're the wizard, you tell me. Zed put his weight on his hands as he leaned toward the man. I can't recall anything that used to be in this book. I can't recall anything about the blank places in all the other books of prophecy that have missing text. Chase's expression turned grim. There are others with blank places? Zed nodded as he smoothed back his hair. He gazed in the darkening window, trying to see himself reflected, but he couldn't yet. It was still too light outside. Does my hair need to be brushed? He looked back at Chase. Does it stick out too much? Chase cocked his head. What? Never mind, Zed muttered with a dismissive wave of his hand. The point is... I've discovered blank places in a number of books of prophecy, and I'm baffled by it. Chase shifted his weight and folded his arms, his brow bunched. He was beginning to look seriously concerned, which on Chase meant that he looked like he thought he might need to slaughter large numbers of people. Maybe I'd better stay for now. We don't have to leave tomorrow. We can wait until you find out if there is some sort of trouble at hand. Zed sighed beginning to wish that he wouldn't have mentioned anything. This wasn't really a problem for Chase. Zed shouldn't have gotten the man all worked up over something he wouldn't understand or could do anything about. It was just that it was so blasted odd. That isn't necessary. This kind of trouble isn't likely to need to have you strangle it into submission. It's an entirely different kind of problem. This is book trouble. 
I don't want to burden you with worry. It's my area, and I'm sure I'll figure it out sooner or later. I only wondered what you might think of such a thing. Sometimes it helps to have a fresh view. Chase waggled a finger over the book. Well, what does that last part mean? That first contest him before they plot to heal him part? You said it was prophecy about Richard. That sounds like trouble, like someone is going to plot against him. No, not necessarily. Zed wiped a hand across his mouth as he tried to think of a way to explain it. The word plot in prophecy often means nothing more sinister than to lay out a plan, like plotting a course of action, you might say. In this case, the passage was talking about those who are his closest advisors, his allies. So when it talks about plotting to heal him, it most likely means that they must first convince him that he needs their help. And then once they are able to convince him, these allies, that would most likely be some of us, are going to set about planning a way to heal him. Heal him from what? It doesn't say. So then it isn't serious. Zed gave the boundary warden a meaningful look. I believe that may be the part that is blank. Then it is serious. Richard is in trouble. He needs help. Maybe he's hurt. Zed shook his head unhappily. In my experience, prophecy is rarely so overt. But that could be the case. Zed appraised the man for a moment. We're a long way from needing to dream up things to worry about. In addition, the chronology of prophecy is always troublesome. For all I know, the part we're discussing could have already happened. It could, for instance, be talking about a time Richard had a fever as a child, and I had to find the proper herbs to heal him. Then it just as well could be past history. Zed turned up his palms in frustration. It could be. Without the missing text, or knowing a lot more about prophecy than I do, it's probably impossible to put this in the context of his life. Chase nodded, but then stepped out of the way as the door opened and Rika swept into the room. She reached out to take the bowls, but paused when she saw that they were still full. What's the matter? Why haven't you eaten? When Zed waved a hand as if trying to swish the issue away, she looked over her shoulder at Chase. Is he sick? I thought he would have scraped the bowl clean by now and licked the smell off the ceiling. Maybe we had better think of a way to make him eat. See what I mean about plotting, Zed said to Chase. It could be no more serious than that. Rika surveyed Zed's face for a moment, as if checking for any overt signs of insanity, then turned her attention to Chase. What is he jabbering about? Something about books, Chase told her. She turned a growing glare on Zed. Well, after all the trouble I went to fixing you this meal, you are going to sit right down and eat it. If you don't, then I'll feed it to the worms in the midden heap instead. Then, when you get hungry later and come to me complaining, you will only have yourself to blame. You'll get no sympathy from me. Startled, Zed blinked at her. What? What did you say? I'm going to feed it to the worms if you don't... Bags! Zed snapped his fingers. That's it? He held his arms out to her. Rika, you're a genius. I could hug you. Rika straightened defiantly. I prefer to accept your adoration from afar. Zed wasn't listening to her. He rubbed his hands together as he tried to remember exactly where it was that he'd seen the reference. It had been ages ago, but how long ago exactly, and where? What is it? Chase asked. Have you solved the puzzle? Zed's mouth twisted with the effort of thought. I recall reading a reference to such an event. I remember seeing some kind of exegesis. A what? An explanation, an analysis of this issue. So then it is some book thing? Zed nodded. Yes, exactly. I just need to remember where it was that I saw the passage. It was about worms. Chase cast a sidelong glance at Rika before he scratched his head of thick, graying brown hair. Worms? Zed dry-washed his hands as vague recollections ghosted through his mind. Those shadowy memories were real, he was sure of it. 
but despite his frantic effort to grasp them and pull them into the light of consciousness, they remained just out of reach. Zid, what are you talking about? Rika asked. What did you say? Worms? What? Oh, yes, that's right. Worms. Prophetic worms. It was some kind of evaluation, I think, examining if such a thing might be able to erode prophecy. Chase and Rika stared at him as if he were crazy, but said nothing. Zed paced from the table to the corner bookcase and back. He pushed the heavy oak chair aside with a foot as he walked back and forth, thinking. He ran through a list of places that might have a book that would contain such a reference. There were libraries all over the keep. There were thousands of books in those libraries, maybe tens of thousands. If he had even seen the reference at the wizard's keep, he had visited any number of libraries in other places. There were a number of archives in the Confessor's Palace down in Adendril. There were palaces on King's Row, also in Adendril, that contained extensive collections of books. There were any number of cities that Zed had visited with repositories and archives. There were so many books, how was he to remember one he hadn't seen for ages, perhaps since he was young? What exactly are you talking about? Rika asked when she tired of watching him pace. What explanation are you talking about? I'm not sure yet. It was a long time ago. Had to be. Had to be when I was young. I will remember, I'm sure of it. I just have to give it some thought, even if it takes all night. I will remember where I saw the passage. I wish I had my reason chair, he muttered as he turned away. Rika frowned at Chase as she kept an eye on Zed as he paced. He's what? Back in Westland, Chase said in a low voice, he had a chair on his porch where he would sit and think, where he would reason out problems. That was back when everything started, when Dark and Rawl came and tried to capture him and Richard. They fled just in time. They came to me and I led them through a gap to the boundary. Seems to me that there are chairs enough around here. He's practically tripping over that one there. Rika's mouth twisted with exasperation. Besides, a person doesn't need a chair to make their brain work. At least if they do, they have bigger problems. I suppose. Together with Rika, Chase watched Zed pace for a while. Finally, not being able to stand around, he caught the sleeve of Zed's robes. I guess I'd better go see to Rachel while you work out your solution. I want to make sure she gets her things together and gets to bed. Zed swished a hand, urging the man on his way. Yes, you're right. Go ahead. Tell her I will come to kiss her goodnight after a while. I just need to think on this a bit. Once he was gone, Rika leaned a leather-covered hip against the heavy desk and folded her arms under her breasts. Are you saying that the words of prophecy vanishing was caused by some kind of worm? Like a bookworm that eats the paste or the paper? No, it eats the words, not the paper. Then it's... What? Some kind of tiny little worm that eats ink? Annoyed at the interruption, Zed halted his pacing to stare at her. Eats? No, no, not in that way. This is something of magic. A tricky little twist of something clever. If I recall correctly, it was referred to as a prophetic worm because it could eat away at the branches of prophecy, much like wood boar worms eat away at a tree. It starts with related prophecy, either in subject or in chronology, like wood boars might infest a particular branch. Once established, this kind of worm begins eating away the tree of prophecy. In this case, the branch is the one having to do with the time since Richard was born. Rika looked genuinely fascinated and at the same time distraught. She straightened and tilted her head toward him. Really? Magic can do such a thing? Zed, holding his elbow in one hand and his chin in the fingertips of the other, made a low sound deep in his throat. I think so. Maybe. I'm not sure. He heaved an impatient, irritable sigh. I'm trying to remember. I only saw the reference once. I can't recall if it was a theory I read, or if it was the spell itself, or if it was only a suggestion in a book of records, 
or if it... Wait. He stared up at the beamed ceiling as he squinted with the effort of recollection. It was before Richard was born, I'm sure of that much. I remember that I was a young man. That would mean that it had to be when I was here. That much makes sense. And if I was here... Zed's head came back down. Dear spirits. Rika leaned in. What? Dear spirits, what? I remember, Zed whispered, his eyes going wide. I remember where I saw it. Where? Shoving his sleeves higher up his bony arms, Zed headed for the door. Never mind, I will see to it. You just go about your patrolling or something. I'll be back later. Chapter 33 with the sun going down, the air was beginning to cool as Zed raced down the broad rampart. The huge stones of the crenellated wall radiated heat they had stored from the hot sun beating down on them all day. The city far below the mountainside was melting into a sea of gloom, while pink rays of the departing sun caressed the tops of some of the tallest towers of the keep high overhead. The dying light of dusk had brought a still quiet, touched only by the distant whisper of the cicadas. At an intersection of ramparts, Zed ran around the corner to the right. Unlike the rampart at the edge of the keep, which overlooked a drop-off of thousands of feet down the sheer face of the mountain, the narrower interior bastion wall had precipitous drop-offs to both sides. Yet, within the massive complex that gave a clear view of nearly windowless walls descending down into the darkness, Courtyards far below provided the refreshment of open air directly off some of the lower floors within the keep. Zed imagined that people who in the past had worked in the lower reaches of the keep must have appreciated being able to step outside from time to time. As he ran down the narrow bastion path, bridges to various towers crossed overhead. Soaring up before him at the end of the pathway was an immense, imposing wall with vertical rows of projecting keystones for interior floors. There was a grand double entrance door at the base of that looming wall with designs above reliefs of columns carved in the wall beneath the arched stone lintel. But Zed instead took to an opening in the side rail to take the steps down. The seemingly eternal flight of stairs descended down a long, sloping lip built into the side of the cliff-like bastion wall. He needed to go down into the lower reaches of the keep, deep within the mountain, to places where no one ever went. To places no one but he even knew existed. The stone banister on the open, exposed side of the stairs wasn't very high, and as a consequence, the descent down the straight run of hundreds of feet of stairs, with no landings, was a harrowing experience. To his left rose the carefully fit stone blocks of the imposing bastion wall. To his right was a drop-off that would make any self-respecting cliff proud. Going down that monumental run of stairs always made Zed feel tiny. He could see little more at the bottom than the jagged formation of dark rock at the base of one of the round towers rising up from the small courtyard. Partway down, Zed realized that he heard footsteps racing to catch him. He stopped and turned. It was Rika. What do you think you're doing? He called up to her. The wind, rising up the narrow canyon formed by the stone walls all around, lifted his hair and his robes. It almost felt as if his bony frame might lift right off the stairs and be carried away like a dried leaf on an updraft. Rika came to a panting halt a few steps above him. What does it look like I'm doing? It looks like you're not doing what I told you to do. Let's go, she said, swishing her hand to urge him on. I'm coming with you. I told you that I would see to this. I told you to go patrol or something. This is trouble that concerns Lord Rall. It's just some information in old books that I need to check into. Chase and Rachel are leaving early in the morning. You would be in with Rachel telling her a story and tucking her in unless there was something going on that has you really worried. This is about Lord Rall. If it has you worried, then it has me worried. I'm going with you. 
Zed didn't want to stand out on the open steps arguing with her, so he didn't. He turned and raced downward, holding up his robes in both fists so that he wouldn't trip and fall. Besides going on seemingly forever, the steps were frighteningly steep. A fall so high up on the steps could easily be fatal. Finally reaching the bottom, Zed stopped on the first stepping stone and turned back. Stay on the stones. Rika glanced around at the expanse of viney ground cover. Beyond were walls on two sides that rose up for hundreds of feet without interruption. Behind was the stairs and bastion wall. To the right was a jutting mass of bedrock from which the tower rose. Why? she asked as she followed Zed across the stepping stones. Because I said so. He didn't feel like spending time explaining traps of magic. Were she to step off the stones, the shields would not just warn her, but prevent her from going where she shouldn't be. Still, for those not possessing the proper power, it was always best to stay completely away from shields whenever possible. If the shields failed to stop intruders from crossing this secluded courtyard, the vines would snare them. While the victim struggled to escape, these particular vines would tangle around the ankles. Stimulated by struggling, the vines rapidly sprouted wicked thorns that penetrated into bone where they then anchored themselves. Freeing anyone trapped in the vines was a painful, bloody affair, and more often than not, fatal. The fences at the wizard's keep were not hesitant in their purpose. Those vines are moving, Rika snatched his sleeve. Those vines are moving like a nest of snakes. Zed scowled back over his shoulder. Why do you think I told you to stay on the stepping stones? He lifted a lever and pulled open the second round-topped door he came to and ducked inside. He could feel Rika practically breathing down his neck. Reaching blindly in the darkness, his bony fingers found a smooth sphere in the bracket to the right. As he passed his hand over the glossy surface, it began to glow with a greenish light. The entry room was small, made of simple, undecorated stone block walls. Overhead was a beam and plank ceiling. Against the wall to the right was a single short slab of slate built in to provide a bench in case the stairs had left any visitor in need of a brief rest. In both of the other two walls were two dark passageways going off in separate directions. Along the wall above the slab bench were dozens of brackets, over half of them holding spheres that glowed faintly with the same color of greenish light as the one he had first touched. Zed lifted one of the spheres from a bracket. It was heavy, made from solid glass, but there were other elements fused into this glass, and those elements responded to the stimulus of the gift. In his hand, the greenish cast changed to a warmer yellow glow. He let a spark of his gift lift through the sphere, and it brightened, throwing harsh shadows down the two halls ahead of them. With a sharp jab of a bony finger, he sat Rika on the bench. This is as far as you go. Grim determination was etched on her face as her blue eyes watched him. Something strange is happening with the books of prophecy. You've been fretting over those books for days now. You haven't eaten or slept. But worse by far is that the prophecies that are vanishing are about Lord Rao. It was an observation, not a question. He'd thought that his turmoil had been all internal. She had been quietly paying more attention than he'd given her credit for. Or maybe he had just been too distracted to notice her paying attention. In either case, it was not a good sign that he had been so preoccupied that he hadn't even been aware of her marking how absorbed and unsettled he'd been. Near as I can tell, you are right in that a great many of those vanished prophecies are about Richard, but I don't think they all are. From what I have been able to determine, however, they all have to do with prophecy pertaining to a time after he was born. That doesn't mean that they are all about him, though. The blank places in the books are extensive. Since I can't remember what those blank places said, there obviously is no way to tell what they were about, making it impossible to know the subject individual of the missing prophecies. But from what you can piece together, they mostly have something to do with Lord Rao. 
This, too, had not been a question but a statement of observation, or at least reasoned speculation. This was a moored Sith asking questions that revolved around the issue of the safety of her Lord Rao. Zed could see that she was in no mood for any evasive explanations. I would have to agree that Richard, if not central, is at least deeply connected with the trouble in the books of prophecy. Rika rose up from the bench. Then this is no time for you to go all secretive on me. This is important. Lord Rao is vital to all of us. This is not only about the safety of your grandson, but about the future of all of our lives. And I'm saying to, it is not only important to you, he is important to all of us. If you alone discover something significant and anything happens to you, then we could all be left at a dead end. This is more important than you keeping your secrets. Zed put his hands on his hips and turned away for a moment, considering. He finally turned back to her. Rika, there are things down there that no one knows about. There are good reasons for that. I'm not going to steal any treasure, and if you fear me seeing some secret of the ages, then I will be willing to swear on my life to keep it secret, unless it is necessary for me to reveal it to Lord Rahl. It's more than that. Many of the things in the lower reaches of the keep are incredibly dangerous to anyone who goes near them. There are things of incredible danger outside the keep as well. We no longer had the luxury of secrets. Zed watched her eyes. She had a point. If anything happened to him, the information, too, was as good as dead. He had always planned on someday letting Richard know about this, but there had never been any time. And until the problem with the books of prophecy had cropped up, it hadn't seemed critical. Still, this was not Richard who would see these things. What do you think, wizard, that I will go to town and gossip about what I've seen? Who is left to tell? The Order has overrun most of the New World, and everyone has fled Aden Drill for Dahara. Dahara hangs by a thread. Our future hangs by a thread. There are reasons that some knowledge is kept hidden. There are also reasons that wise men sometimes must share what they know. Life is what matters. If knowledge will help preserve an advanced life, then that knowledge should not be hidden, especially when it may be lost right when it could be that it's needed most. Zed pressed his lips tight as he considered her words. He had discovered this secret when he had been a boy. His whole life, he'd never told another person about it. No one had instructed him to keep it a secret, nor could they. No one but he knew about it. Still, he knew that there had to be a reason that this was not something that was meant to be widely known. This had been kept secret for a reason. He just didn't know what that reason was. Zed, for Lord Raal's sake, for the sake of our cause, let me come with you. He appraised her determination for a moment. You can never reveal this to anyone. Except for Lord Raal, I will never reveal it to another. Mord Sith often go to their graves without revealing the things they know. Zed nodded. All right. It goes to your grave with you unless something happens to me. If so, then you must tell Richard what I show you this night. You must swear to me that you will never tell anyone else about this, though, not even your sister Mord Sith. Without hesitation, Rika held her hand out to him. I swear... Zed clasped her hand, and in so doing, struck the agreement, accepting her word. When he had been first wizard during the war with Dahara, before he had put up the boundaries and killed Panis Rall, Darken Rall's father, if anyone had told him that he would someday make such an agreement with a moored Sith over something so important, he would have thought they were crazy. He was grateful that such things had changed for the better. Chapter 34 It's a complex route, Zed told her. Rika arched an eyebrow. Have you ever had to come find me because I got lost patrolling the keep? Zed realized that he hadn't. He knew very well how easy it was to become lost in the keep. In fact, that was one of its defenses. In several places, when trying to travel through the keep, one came upon interconnected rooms numbering in the thousands. 
In those places, there were no hallways except for the stairs going up or down. Passage through those three-dimensional mazes was necessary to get into several well-protected areas. It was deceptively easy to become forever lost in the morass of those interconnected rooms. Even people who had grown up in the keep could easily become lost in there. An invader, unfamiliar with the place, and if they went too deep into the labyrinth, faced a formidable challenge just to find their way back out, much less to make a passage all the way through and then to escape. Once you had been through a few rooms, through a few doorways, it was amazing how similar everything looked. There were no windows to help, and directions soon became meaningless. There was virtually no way to tell if you recalled seeing a room or a doorway before. One looked much like the last dozen you'd seen. There had been spies and such in the past who had become lost in the maze of rooms. In ages past, it had not been entirely unusual to find a body in there. Of course, not all those who intended harm were strangers. In the past, some had been traitors. No, I guess you never have become lost, Zed finally agreed. Not yet, anyway. You've not been here long enough to begin to explore the majority of the place. There are dangers of every sort. Getting lost in the labyrinth that is the keep is only one of the perils. Where we're going is like that. It's even easier to get lost down there. You will have to do your best to remember your way. I'll help you where I can. Rika nodded, seemingly unconcerned. I'm good at remembering things like a series of turns. I memorize them when I'm patrol. Don't get overly confident. This is more complex than a series of turns. I myself have become lost in the keep, and I grew up here. There is not only one right way to get where we're going. Sometimes the route you took the last time won't work this time because down in the lower reaches of the keep, the shields sometimes shift by themselves to different passageways. It's part of their design to make it more difficult to get through. For instance, if a spy were to draw a map for their cohorts. Unimpressed, Rika shrugged. I understand. The people's palace is like that in some of the sections where the public isn't allowed. Complex, with the open passages one can get through changing from time to time. Additionally, there is no direct route to anywhere, even if all the passages happen to be open, which they never are. I remember. I was there before, although I was in the public sections, but that was confusing enough. It had been after Dark and Rawl had captured Richard. I had the advantage, though, in that the People's Palace is made in the form of a spell drawn on the face of the ground, and I know how that particular spell is constructed. So I know where the primary arms and the connecting links are located. Well, Rika said, we had to be able to find different passages through the place so that we could get from area to area if it was ever invaded. Or if we are chasing someone, we had to be able to think of a way to get ahead of them. We have to be able to do more than simply remember a series of turns. We must comprehend the whole of the place we pass through. In my head, the turns I take make up parts of a picture of a place. Every turn adds to that picture. With that ever-growing image in my mind, I can find my way by taking a different way, because I can see where the other parts are and how they lock together. Zed blinked in astonishment. That seems quite a remarkable talent. I always could understand that kind of thing better than I can understand people. Zed grunted a brief laugh. I think you understand people more than you admit to. She only smiled. All right, now listen to me, he said. You will not only need to remember a great many turns this night. There is more. The only way to get where we are going is through a number of shields. You are not gifted. So the only way for you to pass through those shields is for a gifted person to help get you through. If it ever becomes necessary, Richard can take you through them, like I will take you through tonight. But no matter how well you know the place, or how the shields shift, there is no way to get through without having to pass the shields. So you won't be able to get through alone. That means you won't be able to practice the route by yourself. 
He shook a finger before her face to make his point. Don't even think to try to force your way through the shields. To attempt to do so would be fatal. Rika nodded. I understand. I would have no reason to need to get through without you or Lord Rao. Zed leaned even closer to her. On your word and your life. I have already given you my word and sworn it on my life. That is the way it will be. Zed closed the matter with a single nod. Good, let's go. With Rika close at his heels, Zed rushed down the narrow stone hall to the left, their way lit by the globe he carried. Glass spheres in brackets in the distance glowed faintly once coming into sight. As they passed them, each brightened at his approach and dimmed as he moved on with the one he had taken. At the first stairway they came to, Zed took it up, knowing that to descend to his destination, he first needed to traverse several impassable areas of the lower keep by going higher. They made their way down broad corridors lined with elegant wood paneling and patterned stone floors, and then through several rooms that served as study areas outside nearby libraries. The rooms had dozens of thick carpets scattered about at various angles among the comfortable chairs. There was ample table space, and there were a number of lamps to provide adequate light for reading. Zed knew because he had spent a great deal of time reading books from the libraries. After passing through a series of plain stone halls that came from various parts of the keep, they at last reached the main artery hallway in the section they had to pass through. The hall was nearly a hundred feet tall, with the sloping walls getting closer together at the top. It felt like walking through an immense cleft in the keep. The sun was already down, so the high slits in the stone did little to illuminate the hallway. They did, however, allow the bats out. Every night at dusk, thousands of the bats poured up from hidden, dark, damp places in the keep and made their way out the high slits in the main hallway. At a gilded doorway, Zed turned to Rika. This passage is shielded. Take my hand and you will be able to pass. She didn't hesitate. Zed went through the shield first. The shield produced a gentle tingling sensation against his skin along the plane of the opening. When he turned back toward her and pulled her hand through that plane of the shield at the doorway, she flinched. It won't hurt you as long as I hold on to you, he assured her. Shall I continue? She nodded. It's just so cold. The feel of it surprised me, that's all. Holding her hand tightly, he drew her the rest of the way through the doorway. Once through, she vigorously rubbed her arms. What would have happened had I tried to go through without you? It's hard to say, since different shields do different things, but let's just say that you wouldn't have made it through. This one has no preliminary warning field, so it may not be fatal. There are a number of shields we will have to pass through that would take the flesh right off your bones. Those kind give ample warning, though. She didn't look too pleased to hear it, but she made no protest. Mord Sith didn't like magic, so he knew she was putting in a great effort to suppress her natural resistance. The gilded doorway led down a hall of white marble all around, the floors, walls, and ceiling. The white color was designed to prevent certain gambits of magic that used conjuring involving color to trick the shield at either end of the hall. At the far end, Zed helped Rika through the shield, this one using heat rather than cold. Once clear of the hall, they went down several flights of dusty black marble steps. At the bottom of the steps, he led her down the left of three forks. The sphere he carried provided a bubble of light around them as they raced through the roughly hewn stone tunnel that took them into simple rooms that were made of simple stone blocks. Most of the rooms had one or two doorways, but some had three or even four openings that led to other rooms. Some were reached by going up a short flight of stairs to yet more rooms. A number of rooms were either up or down only a step or two. Most of the rooms, though, were level with one another. The sizes of the rooms varied little, and not a single one had any furniture whatsoever. Some of the rooms were plastered to make the walls smooth, and a number of those were painted, although the chipped, peeling paint was so faded 
that the colors were barely discernible, leaving them all looking a similar dingy color, since dust had been settling in them for centuries. When Zed had been a boy, he had been lost in the maze of rooms for an entire day. The place was so undisturbed that there were still faint footprints evident in the fine dirt coating on the floors. After going through a seemingly endless series of rooms, they finally emptied into a broad corridor of coarse gray granite blocks. While the corridor was wide, the ceiling was so low that they had to bend down slightly so as not to bump their heads. It was a place that, while empty and simple looking, had always felt ominous to Zed. Around a corner, iron brackets holding more of the glass spheres brightened as they passed and then faded as they continued on. In several places, utilitarian stone stairwells emptied into the low corridor. Several other taller halls branched off the main passageway. At the end of the broad low hall, they finally entered a major passageway that was plastered and painted a sandy color. Reliefs of pillars were spaced down the passage, giving it a grander appearance. When they reached the middle, Zed finally paused. He pointed up at the ceiling. See there? That iron grate overhead that lets the keep breathe, lets fresh air down here? She peered up at the ornate grate. Is that a book? Within the design, crafted from the iron bars, was the outline of an open book. The design, intended as a quick visual reference, denoted a section of the keep that contained a number of libraries. Yes, the grate will help you remember that this is where you must turn. The corridor with that grate above is a main trunk of passageways. There are a number of ways down to this place, and from here you can go by various routes to nearly anywhere in the keep. But here, under this grate, you must turn down this hall. He gestured toward a small hallway. It's the only way to get to where we are going. Zed watched her as she looked around at her surroundings and once more checked the grate overhead. When she was sure and had nodded, they started down a small side hall. The hall contained a series of rooms that Zed believed were once used for maintenance supplies. He knew that one of the rooms still had a number of tools. Beyond, at the end of the hall, were a few roughly constructed rooms made of stone, followed by small square passageways running off in several directions. At the end of the service passageway, they came to a warren of short runs through low service shafts, taking them on a winding route that changed levels by a few feet from time to time. They passed empty rooms and rusted iron doors that stood closed. Cobwebs clogged the shafts in places. In other places, sections of hall that were several feet lower held stagnant water. The rotting carcasses of rats floated in the fetid water. Without a word, they waded through to reach higher ground beyond. When they reached a spiral stone staircase beyond the maze, they descended into the inky darkness, the silent sphere bringing harsh light and shadows to places that had not been lit for years. The stairs were tiny, only large enough for a single body at a time to slip downward. It felt rather like being swallowed down the gullet of some stone monster. At the bottom of the spiral stairs, the light cast harsh shadows down roughly cut passageways that were inspection shafts for part of the keep's foundation. Flecks of quartz in stone foundation blocks the size of small palaces sparkled when the light fell across them. Zed led Rika to the narrow stairs that descended down beside the face of that glittering foundation wall. They both peered over the edge of that slit in the ground before starting down. At the bottom, they followed the narrow slit along the base of the foundation blocks. The stone rose up into the darkness, the sparkling quartz above looking like stars. To the right was a roughly cut wall of crumbling rock. If that softer wall were to collapse, they would be buried alive where no one would ever search for them. The foundation in this part of the keep was kept clear of the soft surrounding rock so that it could move a little if it had to. The foundation blocks had been set down into the harder bedrock below. The narrow slit also provided an areaway for inspection of the foundations. 
Zed had always thought it remarkable that he had never found any block that was failing. There were some that had cracks, but those were said not to be structural problems. When they came to another narrow flight of stairs at the end of the slit, they again went down, deeper into the pitch-black cut. Is there any end to this? Rika asked. Zed looked back over his shoulder, the glowing sphere casting her face in harsh yellow light. We're deep in the mountain and getting closer to one of the side slopes. We still have quite a ways to go. She simply nodded, resigned to however far it was. Do you think you can get this far, providing you have me or Richard to get you through the shields? There had been a number of shields, some that she had not liked going through, for one without the protection of the gift, it was in places a very uncomfortable experience, even with Zed helping her. I think so, she said. In the lower inspection channels, they came to round, tile-lined tunnels that, when need be, also served as drains. Zed entered the complex of tunnels, taking intersections that he remembered since he was a boy. Dripping water echoed through the passages was cold enough to see their breath in the humid air. Water dripped between the tiles in places, making the tunnel slick. At various places, right in the middle of nowhere in the tunnels, they encountered powerful shields that he helped her pass through. Several were so strong that they gave off preliminary warnings long in advance. Zed had to wrap his arms around her in order to protect her enough to get her safely through. There's a lot of rats down here, Rika said. Zed could hear them squeaking by the hundreds all through the honeycombed passageways. The little beasts seemed to scatter before the light could fully illuminate them, so they were in evidence by sound, not by sight, except the dead ones. Yes, are you afraid of rats? She halted and scowled at him. No one likes rats. Can't argue with you about that. At each intersection, Zed pointed out to her the way they had to go. He couldn't imagine how she was ever going to remember the way. He hoped it never became necessary. He hoped to be the one to show Richard. As a boy, Zed had used tracers of magic to learn his way through. Rika paid close attention and watched each of the dark intersections they came to. He was sure that it was more than she had bargained for, and that she would not be able to remember her way. He thought that perhaps he would take her through several more times in order to help her get it all mapped out in her head. After that, he would test her and let her lead the way down. After what seemed like an endless journey, working their way ever lower, they finally entered a colossal room, an immense cave-like chamber that was hollowed out from the interior of the mountain. The granite quarried out of the mountain down in this place had provided some of the stone for the foundation. The quarry, abandoned after the construction was completed, had left behind the huge room. In some places around the sides, the builders of the keep had left fat pillars of stone in place to hold up what they apparently had found to be weaker areas of the ceiling. In spots around the room, there were broad veins of obsidian a black, glassy rock that was unsuitable for building material. Zed had seen it used in a few places in the palace, mostly for decoration. In the glow of the light from the sphere, the surface of the obsidian showed the shiny curved arcs left by being chipped away with chisels, leaving it looking like dazzling fish scales. The center of the gigantic room, where the rock was the hardest, was vaulted to a height of over 250 feet. From the stone evidence, it appeared that the workers had started at the top, taking out huge blocks of stone right under what was the present ceiling. They then began quarrying the next lower level of rock until they eventually had hollowed out the cave-like room. The different levels of galleries around the side were just tall enough and just wide enough between the large square columns for the foundation blocks to be hauled through. Beyond the room were ramps where the blocks had been eased down to the lower parts of the foundation. See there, across the room, Zed asked, pointing at an enormous dark corridor to which he knew the surrounding ramps led. That was constructed first. 
It's the main channel where the foundation blocks were transported from this room to the foundation all along that section of the keep. Look at how the floor is worn by the work. The floor leading into the yawning dark chasm was worn so smooth that it almost looked as if it had been polished. Why didn't we come that way? It would have been a much shorter route. He was impressed that she realized that the primary passageway ran in the direction from which they had come. The stone blocks for the foundation would not have taken the circuitous route they had. You're right, it would have been shorter, but there are shields there that I can't pass. Since I can't get in there because of those shields, I don't know what is in there. But I suspect that the builders probably created rooms in there that contain things that must be protected. I can't really think of any other reason for those shields. Why can't you pass them? You are first wizard. The wizards of that time had both sides of the gift. Richard is the first in thousands of years to be born with the subtractive side as well as the additive. Shields with subtractive magic are deadly and are typically reserved for the most dangerous places or the places that have exceptionally important items they were most concerned about protecting. Zed led Rika across the vast room by a route that kept them close to the outer wall. He rarely came down to this room and so he had to watch the stone wall carefully as they made their way around. When they reached the place he was looking for, he snatched Rika's arm and pulled her to a stop. This is it. Rika blinked as she looked around. To the inexperienced eye, it looked the same as the rest of the room. This is what? The secret place. It looked like the rest of the huge room. Everywhere the walls were scarred with the gouges left by tools used by workers thousands of years before. Zed held up the glass sphere so she could see where he pointed. Here. See that gouge up high? The one going at this angle following the fissure and a little fatter in the middle? Slip your left hand into it. There's a cleft in the back of the gouge, deeper into the fissure. Rika frowned at him but then stood on her tiptoes and slid her hand into the groove up to her knuckles. There's a lip in the rock down here, he said. I used it when I was smaller. If you can't reach, step up on the edge. No, I got it, she said. Now what? You're only halfway in. Put your hand in deeper. She wiggled her fingers and worked her hand in farther until it was in up to her wrist. That's as far as it will go. It's solid where my fingertips are. Move your longest finger up and down until you find a hole. She made a face as she worked her fingers. Got it. Zed took her right hand and guided it into a similar gouge in another part of the same fissure down at waist level. Find a hole in the back of this one as well. When you do, push a finger firmly into both holes. She made a little sound deep in her throat with the effort. Found it. I've got them both. I'm pushing. All right now, as you push with both fingers, Put your right foot up here on the wall right on the other side of this chink and give it a good shove. She frowned at him, but did as he said. Nothing happened. Can't you push any harder than that? Don't tell me that you aren't as strong as a skinny old man. She shot him a scowl and then used her grip in the handholds for leverage as she grunted with effort and gave the wall a good shove with her boot. Suddenly, the face of the rock began moving away. Zed urged Rika to step back. They both watched as a section of the wall silently slid back as if it were a massive door, which was exactly what it was. Despite its monumental weight, it was so perfectly balanced that once the two finger latches were released, it pivoted with nothing more than a stout shove. Dear spirits, Rika whispered, as she leaned toward the opening and peered into the dark maw. How did you ever find such a place? I found it as a child. Actually, I found the other end. Once I came through into here, I knew where this spot was, and I took careful note so that I was able to find it again. The first few times I couldn't find it, so I had to come through again. Well, what is it? 
When I was a boy, it was my salvation. It was the way I was able to sneak back into the keep without having to come across the bridge and in the front like everyone else. She suspiciously arched an eyebrow. You must have been a troublesome child. Zed smiled. I have to admit that there were those who would agree with that. This place served me well. I was also able to get in here when the Sisters of the Dark had taken the keep. They only knew to guard the front entrance. They, like everyone else alive, didn't know this place existed. So this is what you wanted to show me? A secret way into the keep? No, that's by far the least important or remarkable thing about this place. Come on and I'll show you. Her suspicion flared again. Just what kind of place is it? Zed held up the sphere of light as he leaned toward her and whispered, Beyond is eternal night, the passage of the dead. Chapter 35 The distant howl of a wolf woke Richard from a dead sleep. The forlorn cry echoed through the mountains but went unanswered. Richard lay on his side in the surreal light of false dawn, idly listening, waiting for a return cry that never came. Try as he might, he couldn't seem to open his eyes for longer than the span of a single slow heartbeat, much less gather the energy to lift his head. Shadowy tree limbs appeared to move about in the murky darkness. Richard gasped as he fully awoke. He awoke angry. He was lying on his back. His sword lay across his chest, one hand clutching the scabbard, the other gripping the hilt so hard that the letters of the word truth were pressed painfully into his palm on one side and his fingertips on the other. The sword of truth was pulled partway out of its scabbard. Its anger, too, had partly slipped its bounds. The first faint traces of dawn were just beginning to silently steal through the forested mountainside. The thick woods were quiet and still. Richard slid the blade back into its scabbard and sat up, laying the sword down beside him on his bedroll. He drew his legs up and put his elbows on his knees as he ran his fingers back through his hair. His heart still raced from the sword's rage. It had stolen into him without his conscious awareness or direction, but he wasn't surprised or alarmed. It was hardly the first time he had begun to draw the sword as he'd remembered that fateful morning while slipping the bonds of sleep. Sometimes he woke to find that he'd pulled the blade completely free. Why did he keep having that memory as he awoke? He knew all too well the reason. That was the morning he had awakened to find Kalin missing. It was the terrible memory of the morning she'd disappeared. It was a waking nightmare about the nightmare that had become his life, and yet he knew that there was something about it that kept making it go through his mind. He had been over it a thousand times, but he couldn't figure out what was so meaningful about that particular memory. The wolf waking him had been a bit odd, but that didn't seem so strange that it would keep haunting him. Richard looked around in the deep gloom, but he didn't see Kara. Off through the thick stands of trees, he could just make out the faint stain of red streaking the rim of the eastern sky. The slash of color almost looked like blood seeping through a gash in the slate black sky beyond the perfectly still trees. He was bone weary from the relentless pace of their wild ride up from deep in the old world. They had been stopped a number of times by patrolling soldiers scattered throughout the Midlands and by occupying troops. It was by no means the main force of the Imperial Order, but they had been trouble enough. Once they'd let Kara and Richard, posing as a stone carver and his wife, go on their way to a job Richard had invented for the glory of the Order. The rest of the times the two of them had had to fight their way out of the situation, those encounters had been bloody. He needed more sleep. They had gotten very little on their journey, but as long as Kalin was missing, they couldn't afford to sleep any more than was absolutely necessary. He didn't know how much time he had to find her, but he didn't intend to waste any of it. 
he refused to believe that his time had long since run out. One of the horses had died of exhaustion not long ago. He couldn't remember exactly when. Another had come up lame a while back, and they'd had to abandon it. Richard would worry about finding more horses later. There were more important concerns at hand. They were close to Agaden Reach, Shota's home. For the last two days, they had been climbing steadily into the formidable mountains that ringed the reach. As he stretched his aching, tired muscles, he again tried to think of how he would convince Shota to help him. She had helped him before, but that was no guarantee she would help him this time. Shota could be difficult, to say the least. There were people who were so terrified of the witch woman that they wouldn't even say her name aloud. Zed had told him once that Shota never told you anything you wanted to know without also telling you something that you didn't want to know. Richard couldn't really imagine what he didn't want to know, but he understood quite clearly what it was he did want to know, and he intended Shota to tell him anything she knew about Kalin's disappearance or where she might be. If Shota refused, there was going to be trouble. As his anger heated, he realized that he felt the cool, tingling touch of mist on his face. It was then that he also noticed something moving in the trees. He squinted in an effort to see in the darkness. It couldn't be the breeze moving the leaves. There was no wind in the silent pre-dawn woods. Shadowy tree limbs appeared to move about in the murky darkness. There had been no wind at all that morning either. Richard's sense of alarm rose to match his heart rate. He stood in his bedroll. Something was slipping through the trees. It wasn't disturbing the branches or brush the way a person or an animal would. It was higher up, maybe at eye level. There simply wasn't enough light for him to see what it was. As dark and still as the morning was, though, he couldn't be certain that there really was something there. It might have been his imagination. Being this close to Shota certainly was enough to make him uneasy. While she might have helped him in the past, she had also caused him no end of trouble. But if nothing was there in the trees, then why was his skin tingling with dread? And what was the almost imperceptible sound he heard, like a soft hiss? Without taking his eyes off the dark woods, Richard reached out and put his fingertips against a nearby spruce for balance as he carefully squatted down enough to pick up his sword from where it lay on the bedroll. As he quietly slipped the baldric over his head, he tried to focus his eyes in the darkness out ahead of him to see what, if anything, was moving. Whatever was moving, it couldn't be much, yet he was more and more convinced by the moment that it really was something. The most disconcerting aspect of it was the way it moved. It didn't move in short bursts like a bird flitting from branch to branch, or in rapid start and stop spurts like a squirrel. It didn't even move with the stealth of a snake that glided, then paused, then glided some more. This moved not only fluidly and quietly, but continuously. The horses, off through the trees in a corral Richard had constructed by using saplings to fence off the end of a narrow chasm, snorted and stamped their hooves. A flock of birds in the distance suddenly burst from their roost and took to wing. For the first time, Richard realized that the cicadas were silent. Richard detected the faint scent of something out of place in the forest. Carefully, quietly, he sniffed the air trying to place the scent. He thought it might be a whiff of something burning. The odor wasn't anywhere near as strong as a fire would be. It almost smelled like a campfire. But they had no campfire. Richard hadn't wanted to take the time or to chance attracting attention. Kara had a lantern with a light shield around it, but it didn't smell like the lantern flame. He scanned the woods all around, checking for Kara. She was on watch, so she was probably nearby, but Richard didn't see her anywhere. Surely she wouldn't have gone far, especially not after the attack the morning Kalin had disappeared. 
She was all too worried about his safety and knew that this time if he was shot with an arrow there would be no Nietzsche to save his life. No, Kara would be close. His instinct was to call out for her, but he suppressed the urge. He first wanted to find out what was happening, to find out what was wrong before he called out an alarm. An alarm would also alert any adversary that he was already aware of them. It was better to let an opponent, especially an opponent sneaking up on you, believe that they had not been detected. Page 357. As he studied the surrounding area, Richard thought that there was something not right about the woods. He couldn't put his finger on it, but they looked wrong. He supposed that he had that impression in part because of the curious burning smell. It was still too dark to be able to see anything clearly, but from what he was able to see, the branches didn't seem to look right. There was something odd about the pine boughs, the leaves. They didn't seem to hang naturally. He remembered all too well coming to Agaden Reach the first time. Farther back down the mountains, he had been attacked by some strange creature. As he had been frantically fighting it off, Shota had snatched Kalin and taken her down into the reach. That attack had been in the guise of a stranger trying to lead him to an ambush. The creature had finally been frightened off, and this time there was no such stranger. Still, that didn't mean that such a creature, having failed before, might not this time try a different approach. He remembered, too, that his sword had been all that had kept the monstrous thing at bay. As quietly as possible, Richard slowly drew his sword from its sheath. In an attempt to keep it from making any noise, he pinched the sides of the blade right at the throat of the scabbard, letting the steel slide between his finger and thumb as it slipped out of the scabbard. Even so, the blade hissed ever so softly as it came free. The sword's rage, too, slipped its bounds. As he steadily drew his sword, he began cautiously moving toward the spot where he thought he saw movement. Whenever he was looking elsewhere, he thought that out of the corner of his eye he could see a faint shape of something ahead of him. But when he then looked directly at the place, he couldn't see anything. He didn't know if it was a trick of his sight or if there was nothing to see. He was well aware that in dark conditions the center of the eye's vision was not nearly as good as the peripheral vision. Being a guide, and having spent a great deal of time outdoors at night, he had often used the technique of not looking directly at what it was that he needed to see, but instead gazing at least 15 degrees away from it. At night, the peripheral vision worked better than direct vision. Since leaving his woods where he had been a guide, he had learned that the knack of focusing his awareness to specific places in his peripheral vision while not turning his eyes there was invaluable in sword fighting. Before he had gone three steps, his pant leg came up against something that shouldn't have been there. It was a light contact, almost like a low branch. He halted immediately before putting any pressure on it. He smelled something again, only stronger. It smelled like scorched cloth. He then felt the intense heat against his shin. Quickly, and without making a sound, he drew back. For the life of him, Richard could not figure out what it was he had touched. It was not anything natural that he could think of. He might have suspected that it was a tripwire of some sort to warn anyone hidden in the trees nearby if he moved but a tripwire wouldn't burn him the way this thing had. Whatever it was, it pulled at his pants like it was sticky when he drew away. When he backed free of it, the sleek movement in the trees abruptly halted as if it had detected the contact against his pant leg being broken. The dead silence ringing in his ears was almost painful. The mist was too fine to make any sound hitting the leaves, and the moisture that the pine needles combed from the damp air was not enough to collect and drip very much. Besides, the sound he had heard had been something different than rainwater. 
Richard focused his concentration into the dark shadows, trying to make out what it was that had stopped moving. Then it started again, only more rapidly, as if with more purpose. The soft, silky sound whispering among the limbs of the trees in a way that reminded him of the blade of an ice skate gliding across smooth ice. As Richard backed away, something caught his other pant leg. It was sticky, just like the thing that he'd snagged before. It, too, felt hot. As he turned to see what it was that was against his pant leg, something brushed his arm just above his elbow. He didn't have on a shirt, and the instant the sticky thing touched him, it burned into his flesh. He jerked his arm back and then stepped away from the thing touching his pant leg. With the hand holding the sword, he silently comforted the searing pain on his left arm. Warm blood ran down over his fingers. His anger and the anger flooding into him from the sword together threatened to overpower his sense of caution. He turned around trying to see in the darkness what was there that should not be there. The razor-thin red slash of light at the horizon glinted off his blade as he turned, making the polished metal look like it was coated in blood to match the very real blood covering his hand on the hilt. The shadows around him were beginning to pull inward toward him. Whatever it was, as it moved closer, it caught limbs and boughs all around him, gently pushing leaves and brush aside as it advanced. Richard suspected that the soft hissing sound he heard was actually the sound of vegetation being scorched when it was touched. The smell of burning leaves he had first detected began to make sense to him. He just didn't have any idea what could be causing it or how. He would doubt his judgment, doubt that such a thing could be real, were it not for the fierce burning pain of its touch. He certainly wasn't imagining the blood running down his arm. Instinctively, Richard knew that he was running out of time. Chapter 36 Richard swiftly but silently raised the sword before himself in preparation for an attack. What kind of attack he wasn't sure, but he fully intended to be ready. He touched the cold steel of the blade to his sweat-slick forehead. He spoke the words, Blade be true this day, in a softly inaudible whisper, fully committing himself and his sword to whatever was necessary. A few fat drops of rain splashed against his bare chest. At first sporadic, the fitful rain gradually began to increase a bit. The soft whispering sound of raindrops against the thick canopy of leaves began to spread through the quiet of the woods. Richard blinked drops of water from his eyelashes. At the sound of the limbs moving, he then heard the sudden rush of footsteps starting to run toward him. He recognized Kara's unique gait. Apparently, she had been patrolling around the perimeter of their campsite and had heard the same sounds as he had. Knowing Kara, he wasn't in the least surprised that she had been paying close attention. But under the cover of the sound of the rain all around him, Richard could hear branches and limbs slowly pulling past one another. Here and there, a few small twigs snapped as something drew in closer all around him. Something touched his left arm. He flinched back a step, pulling his arm away from the gummy contact. The burn throbbed painfully. Warm blood now trickled down his arm in two places. He felt something catch the back of his pant leg. He tugged his leg away from the sticky contact. Kara crashed through the trees not far away. Subtle she was not. She threw open a small door on the shield around the lantern she carried, letting a weak beam of light fall across the campsite. Richard was able to see what he thought looked like a strange, dark web of something crisscrossed all around him, woven through trees, shrubs, limbs, and brush. It looked like thick cords of some sort, but organic and gummy. He couldn't imagine what it was or exactly how it had gotten itself everywhere around him. Lord Rall, are you all right? Yes, stay where you are. What's going on? I'm not sure yet. The sound came closer as the still dark strands all around him again began to draw tighter. 
one of them pressed against his back. He flinched away, spun, and slashed with the sword. As soon as he cut it, the whole of the tangle all around him tensed and contracted in toward him. Kara threw open the entire shield around the lantern, hoping to see better. Richard could suddenly see that the glistening threads were nearly cocooning him. He even saw lines of the stuff crisscrossing overhead. As close in as it all was, he was running out of clear space to maneuver. With a flash of comprehension, he understood the silken sound he had heard at first. The fluid, continuous movement was something spinning the filaments around him, as if he were a meal for a spider. These filaments, though, were as thick as his wrist. What exactly they were, he had no idea. What he did know was that when they had touched him, sticking to his pant leg, his left arm, and his back, they delivered painful burns. He could see Kara and her lantern as she dodged this way and that, looking for a way to get through to him. Kara, stay back. It will burn you if you touch it. Burn? Yes, like acid, I think, and it's sticky. Keep away from it or you're liable to get caught in it. Then how are you to get out of the middle of it? I'll just have to cut my way out. You stay there and let me come to you. When the strands pulled in tighter to the left side, he finally swung the sword and struck out at them. The blade flashed in the light of Kara's lantern, slashing through the enveloping tangle of sticky fibers. As they were parted by the blade, they whipped around as if they'd been under tension. Some stuck to trees or limbs, hanging down like murky moss. In the light of the lantern, he could see the leaves shrivel up, evidently from being burned when they were touched by the strands. Whatever was creating the webs of the stuff, Richard didn't see it. The rain began to come down a little harder as Kara darted from side to side, trying to find a way in. I think I can... No, he yelled at her. I told you, keep away from it. Richard swung the sword at the thick, dark ropes wherever they drew in toward him, trying to check their constriction and weaken their integrity. But he was forced not to do so unless he had no choice because the sticky strands were beginning to cling to the blade. I need to help you stop this thing, she called back, impatient to see him free. You'll just get caught up in it. If you do that, then you can be of no help to me. Stay back. I told you, let me cut my way out and come to you. That, at least, looked to have finally dissuaded her from any immediate attempt to try to fight her way through. She stood half-crouched, lips pressed tight in frustrated fury, a geel in her fist, not knowing what to do, not wanting to go against what he told her, and realizing the sense of what he'd said, but at the same time not wanting him to have to fight his way out all by himself. It was a strange, confounding, non-violent kind of battle. There looked to be no rush. The gashes he inflicted didn't seem to cause the thing any pain. The slow, inexorable approach of the surrounding tangle seemed to be trying to lull him into holding back inasmuch as there appeared to be plenty of time to analyze the situation. Despite the quiet appearance, that deceptive calm, Richard found the implacable advance of the surrounding trap alarming in the extreme. Not wanting to give in to that appeal to inaction, Richard swung the sword again, driving into the walls of the tangled web. He could see more of the strands appearing in the woods all around him, even as he tried to fight his way through it. It was reinforcing itself, adding a backdrop even as he slashed the part closest to him. For every dozen strands he cut, two dozen more enfolded him. He kept scanning the forest, trying to see what was creating the growing entanglement so that he could attack the cause and not the result. Try as he might, he couldn't see a lead end or what was spinning the morass but the viscous ropes of it were moving swiftly through the trees and brush, the strands lengthening and multiplying all the time, endlessly adding to and forming more of themselves all around him. Even though it seemed like he had ample time to figure a way out, he knew that such a notion was a fool's empty hope. He was well aware that his time was swiftly running out. His level of alarm rose steadily, his burned flesh throbbed in pain, reminding him of what fate awaited him if he didn't get out. 
There would come a point, he knew, when action would no longer be possible. He knew that once the intricate trap contracted enough, he would die, but he doubted that it would be a quick death. As the net reinforced itself around him and moved inward, Richard attacked, slashing furiously, making a mad effort to hack his way through the tightening entrapment. Every time he swung the sword, though, the blade was further ensnared in the tacky substance that made up the strands. The more of it he cut, the more of it stuck to what was already clinging tenaciously to his sword. The unwieldy mass was getting heavy and making it ever more difficult to cut through the wall. As he tried to hack and slash his way through, a knot of the filaments not only continued to tangle together in a clotted mass around his blade, but began to adhere to the wall of the trap, making it a formidable task just to move the sword. He felt like a fly caught in a spider web. It took a mighty effort to pull the sword away from the wall of the strands. They, in turn, sticking to the sword, stretched and pulled away in gummy strings. This was the first time that Richard had ever encountered an adversary of any sort that gave the sword such difficulty. He had cut through armor and iron bars with it, but this sticky substance, even though it yielded to being cut, simply fell away and stuck to everything. He remembered Addy once asking him which he thought was stronger, teeth or tongue. She had made the point that the tongue was stronger, even though it was much softer and would endure long after the teeth gave out. Although it was in a different context, it had a frightening significance in this instance as well. Some of the gooey strings stretched out and stuck to his pant legs. As he pulled his sword back, a string fell across his right arm. He cried out in pain and dropped to his knees. Lord Rall! Stay there, he called before Kara had a chance to try again to reach him. I'm all right. Just stay where you are. Snatching up a handful of leaves, bark, and dirt, he used the debris to protect his hand as he pulled the dark, clinging substance from his arm. The searing pain caused him to nearly forget everything else except getting it off. As the surrounding fibrous structure drew tighter, the thick strands pulled small saplings over. Branches snapped. Limbs were torn from trees. The woods were filled with a pungent, burning smell. Even with the fury of the sword storming up through him, pulling his anger forth, Richard realized that he was losing the battle. Wherever he cut it, a great many of those cut strands fell back to stick together with others and close the gap. Despite his cutting through the snarled mass of the webs, the net only tangled together and stuck to itself, creating an ever more tightly woven web. His calm frustration began to give way to the panicked realization that he was trapped. That fear powered his muscles as he put all his effort into swinging his sword. He could imagine the strange dark mass miring him, burning his flesh, congealing as it enfolded itself around him, eventually to suffocate him if it didn't first kill him by scorching the flesh off his bones. With all his might, Richard brought the sword down over and over, slashing through a wall of the stuff. More strands beyond those he cut caught up the ones he had severed as they whipped around and fell back. The ones he cut only served to cross over strands beyond and reinforce them. He was not simply failing, but in so doing, helping to strengthen his executioner. Lord Raal, I need to get to you! Kara clearly understood the deadly nature of the threat he was under and wanted to find a way to help get him out of the trouble. And like him, she didn't really have any idea what to do. Kara, listen to me. If you get tangled in it, you'll die. Stay away from it. And whatever you do, don't touch it with your Aegeal. I'll figure something out. Then hurry up and do it before it's too late. As if he wasn't trying. Just give me a minute to think. Panting, trying to catch his breath, he put his back against the protection of a large spruce tree close to his bedroll as he tried to figure out what to do to escape. There was not much room left around the tree and not much time before that space too would be gone. Blood ran down his arms from the wounds where the dark substance had touched him. Those wounds burned and throbbed, making it difficult to think. 
he needed a way to get across the sticky tangle, to get out of the middle of it before it finally captured him for good. And then it came to him. Use the sword for what the sword could do best. Without wasting another moment, Richard stepped away from the tree, spun around, drew back, and with all his might, swung the sword as hard as he could. Knowing that his life depended on it, he put every bit of fury and energy behind the blade, driving it with all his power. The tip whistled as it came around with lightning speed. The blade crashed through the tree with a loud boom that sounded like a lightning strike and did just as much damage. The tree's trunk shattered. Jagged splinters flew everywhere. Long fragments spiraled through the air. Smaller chips and a shower of bark were netted by the sticky tangle beyond. The mighty spruce groaned as the towering crown pulled itself through the tangled canopy above as the tree began to topple. With gathering speed, it plunged through the tight stand of trees, ripping thick branches from other trees as the great weight of the spruce dropped through the crowded forest. As the tree fell, it ripped the strands where the trunk rose through the tangled web above him, pulling gummy ropes along with it, and then it crashed down atop the entanglement of sticky strands, whipping them down against the ground, burying them under the trunk and the thick thatch of limbs. Before the web had time to reform or heal itself and close the yawning gap, Richard leaped up onto the trunk even as it was still rebounding from hitting the ground. He held his arms out and crouched for balance. The rain was picking up and the trunk of the tree was slippery. As the great trunk bounced and settled to the ground and limbs, bark, branches, needles and leaves still rained down on him, Richard used the opportunity to race across the length of the spruce using it like a bridge to cross the sticky net. Panting, he reached Kara free at last of the trap. Kara, having seen him coming, had climbed up on a stout limb to be ready to help him across. She seized his arm to keep him from falling on the wet bark as he ran through the snarl of branches. What in the world is going on? Kara asked through the roar of the downpour as she helped him down to the ground. Richard was still trying to catch his breath. I have no idea. Look, she said, pointing at his sword. The gummy substance still stuck to his sword had begun melting away in the rain. The mass of strands tangled all through the woods were also beginning to soften and sag. As strands came apart, the rain beat the net down, pulling yet more of the long, thick fibers from the trees. It dropped to the ground in dark masses where it hissed in the rain and melted like the first snow of the season, failing to survive as the storm turned back to rain. In the gray dawn, Richard could see the extent of the mass that had woven its way around him. It was an immense snarl. When the tree ripped the weave of the mesh open at the top, it seemed to have undone the integrity of the whole thing, causing its weight to tear itself apart and collapse. With the cold rain coming down harder all the time, the dark strands were washed from the branches and brush. They lay on the ground looking like nothing so much as the dark viscera of some great dead monster. Richard wiped his sword on wet bushes and grasses until the sticky substance was all off. The mass on the ground melted away with increasing speed, evaporating into a gathering gray fog. Back in the shadows of the trees, like steam rising from the entrails of a fresh corpse on a winter day, that dark fog slowly lifted from the ground. Carried on a faint breeze that had come up, murky patches drifted away beyond the thick veil of trees. Back in the cover of trees, that dark fog shifted abruptly in some vague manner that Richard couldn't quite follow, solidifying into an inky black shadow. In a flash, before he could make sense of it, that sinister apparition disintegrated into a thousand fluttering shapes that darted off in every direction as if a dark phantom were decomposing into the rainy shadows and mist. In an instant, they were gone. A chill ran up Richard's spine. Kara stared in astonishment. Did you see that? Richard nodded. It looked something like what the thing back in Altur Rong did after it came through the walls after me. 
It disappeared in much the same way just before it would have had me. Then it has to be the same beast. In the early morning downpour, Richard surveyed the shadows among the trees all around them. That would be my guess. Kara, too, watched the woods all around for any sign of threat. Lucky for us, the rain came when it did. I don't think it was the rain that did it. She wiped water from her eyes. Then what did? I don't know for sure, but maybe just the fact that I escaped its trap. I can't imagine a beast with that kind of power being so easily discouraged. The last time or this time. I don't have any other ideas. I know someone who might, though. He took Kara by the arm. Come on, let's get our things together and get out of here. She gestured off through the woods. You go get the horses. Let me pack up our bedrolls. We can dry them out later. No, I want us out of this place right now. He quickly pulled a shirt out of his pack along with a cloak to try to keep relatively dry. We'll leave the horses. With them fenced into a place where they have grass and water, they'll be fine where they are for a while. But the horses would get us away from here faster. Richard kept an eye on the surrounding woods as he stuffed his arms through the sleeves of his shirt. We can't take them over the mountain pass. It's too narrow in places. And we can't take horses down into Agaden Reach, where Shota lives. They can get a needed rest while we go see the witch woman. Then, when we find out what Shota knows about where Kalin is, we can come back and get the horses. Maybe Shota will even know how we can get rid of this beast that's following me. Kara nodded. Makes sense, except I'd rather get out of here as quickly as we can, and horses would help in that. Richard squatted down and started rolling up his sodden bedroll. I agree with the sentiment, but the pass is close and the horses can't make it over. So let's just get moving. Like I said, the horses need a rest anyway, or they're not going to be any good to us. Kara stuffed the few things she had out back into her pack. She, too, pulled out a cloak. She lifted the pack by a strap and threw it up onto a shoulder. We'll need to get things out of our saddlebags back with the horses. Leave them. I don't want to have to carry any more than we must. It would just slow us down. Kara gazed off through the veil of rain. But someone might steal our supplies. Thieves won't come near Shota. She frowned up at him. Why not? Shota and her companion walk these woods. She's a rather intolerant woman. Oh, great, Kara muttered. Richard swung his pack around onto his back and started out. Come on, hurry. She scurried after him. Have you ever considered that maybe the witch woman is more dangerous than the beast? Richard glanced back over his shoulder. You're a regular little Miss Sunshine this morning, aren't you? Chapter 37 The rain had turned to snow after they'd climbed out of the dense forest and made it into the crooked wood at the transition out of the tree line. Because of the harsh conditions common at that elevation, the stunted trees, mantled in meager vegetation, grew in bizarre, wind-blown shapes. Walking through the crooked wood was like passing among the petrified forms of desiccated souls whose limbs were frozen for all time in tormented stances, as if they had emerged from their graves only to find their feet forever anchored in hallowed ground, preventing them from ever escaping the temporal world. While there were those who would not enter the surreal world of the crooked wood without some form of mystical protection, Richard wasn't superstitious about the place. In fact, he considered all such beliefs to be the refuge of the willfully ignorant. Richard saw through the trappings to what lay beneath all superstition, nothing less than the call to surrender to the view of man as helpless in accomplishing his own ends and dealing with the reality of the world around him in order to further his own survival, instead embracing the notion that he existed only at the whim of vague and unknowable forces that can only be persuaded to stay their cruel and merciless impulses if man falls to his knees in supplication, or if they have to enter a spiritual place by carrying the proper fetish. While Richard had always found it eerie being in a crooked wood, 
He knew what it was and why it had grown to be that way, even if it still felt rather haunting to be in such a place. He was aware that there were basically two ways to deal with that primordial emotion. The superstitious solution was to carry sacred talismans and amulets to ward off spiteful demons and incomprehensible dark forces thought to inhabit such places, hoping that the fates would be persuaded to kindly stay their fickle hand. Even though people proclaimed with complete confidence that such mysterious forces were fundamentally unknowable to mere mortals, they nonetheless passionately believed, without evidence, that they could be certain that the power of charms would soothe the savage temper of those menacing forces, insisting that faith was all that was necessary, as if faith were a mystical plaster with the power to patch over all the yawning holes in their convictions. Believing in free will, Richard instead chose the second way of dealing with such fear, which was to be watchful, alert, and ready to take responsibility for his own survival and life. At its core, that battle of belief between the cruel fates and free will was his essential disagreement with prophecy and why he discounted it. To choose to believe in fate was at once an admission of free will and at the same time an abdication of one's responsibility to it. As he and Kara passed through the crooked wood, Richard kept a watchful eye out, but he saw no legendary beasts or vengeful ghosts. Only the wind-borne snow wandered the wood. Having traveled at a breakneck pace for so long in the oppressive heat and humidity of summer, they found that the encounter with bitter cold high up in the mountain pass made the effort of the climb all the more difficult, especially after being drenched by the miserable rain. Despite being fatigued from the altitude, Richard knew that as wet as they were, they had to keep moving at a brisk pace to keep warm or the cold could easily overcome them. He was well aware that the seductive song of the cold could entice people to stop and lie down for a rest, luring them to surrender to sleep and the death that waited under its inviting cloak. As Zed had once told him, dead was dead. Richard knew that he would be no less dead from the cold than he would be from an arrow. More than that, though, he and Kara were both eager to put distance between them and the trap that had nearly captured him back at their camp. His burns from the brief contact with his would-be death trap had blistered. He shuddered to think of what had nearly happened. At the same time, he was leery about going to see Shota in her lair at Agaden Reach. The last time he had been in the Reach, she had told him that if he ever came back there, she would kill him. Richard didn't doubt her word or her ability to carry out the threat. Even so, he believed Shota would be his best chance of getting the kind of help necessary to find Kalin. He was desperate to find someone who could tell him something useful, and after going through a list of things he might do, people he might go to, and in the end, he couldn't come up with anyone else who could be as potentially informative as Shota. Nietzsche hadn't been able to offer any solutions. Zed, he knew, might be able to help him in some ways, and maybe there were others with the capacity to be able to add some piece to the puzzle. But to Richard's mind, when all was said and done, none of them were as likely as Shota to be able to point him in the right direction. That alone made the choice simple. When he glanced up, Richard briefly saw the snow cap through gaps in the driving snow. Some distance off, over the open, broken ground of the steep slope, the trail over the pass would skirt the lower reaches of the mountain's year-round icy mantle. The clouds, laden with moisture, clung to the soaring gray rock. The low trailers of mist and fog dragging past left visibility limited in most places and nearly non-existent in others. It was just as well. The precipitous drop-offs in spots along the infrequently used and increasingly slippery trail offered frightening glimpses down the towering mountainside. When a fresh flight of icy gusts carried curtains of wet snow into their faces, Richard pulled his cloak tight against the buffeting onslaught. Out of the cover of the trees, making their way across the loose scree, they had to lean not only into the steep incline but into the wind. 
Richard hunched a shoulder, trying to keep the icy wet sting off his face. Wind-driven snow built a brittle crust on one side of his cloak. With wind howling through the mountain pass, talking was difficult at best. The altitude and the exertion left them both winded and in no condition to be able to easily carry on a conversation. Just getting the air they needed was effort enough, and he could tell by the look on Kara's face that she felt just as nauseated by the altitude as he did. Richard wasn't in the mood to talk anyway. He'd been talking to Kara for days, and it never got him anywhere. Kara, for her part, seemed just as frustrated by his questions as he was by her answers. He knew that she thought his questions were absurd. He thought her answers were. The inconsistencies and gaps in Kara's recollection were at first disappointing and confounding, but eventually they became maddening. Several times he'd had to bite his tongue and remind himself that she was not doing it to be malicious. He knew that if Kara could have honestly said what he wanted to hear, she would have eagerly done so. He knew, too, that if she lied, it would be of no help in getting Kalin back. He needed the truth. That, after all, was why he was going to see Shota. Richard had systematically gone through a long list of times when Kara had been with him and Kalin. Kara, though, remembered events that should have been momentous to her in ways that were not consistent with what had really happened. In a number of cases, such as the time he had gone to the Temple of the Winds, Kara simply didn't recall key parts of the circumstances in which Kalin had been involved. In other instances, Kara remembered events very differently from how they had actually happened. Happened, at least, as Richard remembered them. There were depressing moments when he sank into a despondent fear that it was he who was for some reason the one with the problem. Kara thought that it was he who was remembering things that had never taken place. Although she didn't try to put too fine an edge to her convictions, the more things he brought up, the more she thought his delusions about a fantasy wife were cropping up everywhere in his memory like weeds after a rain. But Richard's clear memory of events and the way those events were knit tightly together always brought him back to the solid conviction that Kalin was real. Kara's memory about certain incidents was very clear and very different from his, while in regard to other things her memory was agonizingly fuzzy. That his story of situations was so different from her memory of those same situations only served in Kara's mind to further convince her that he was even more delusional than she had previously realized or feared. While that obviously saddened her, he'd continued to press her. At his and Kalin's wedding, Kara had been the only moored Sith in attendance. Richard knew that such an event had been significant to her in more ways than one. Yet Kara remembered only that she'd gone with him to the Mud People's village. And why did they go there if not for the wedding? Kara said that she didn't know for certain why he'd gone there, but she was sure that he had his reasons. Her duty was to go where he went and protect him, not to question his motive every time he turned around. Richard wanted to pull his hair out. Kara didn't remember that she, Kalen, and Richard had traveled together to the wedding site in the Sliff. At the time, Kara had been apprehensive about climbing down into the Sliff's well and breathing in what appeared to be living Quicksilver. Yet now she had no awareness that Kalen had helped her overcome her anxiety about traveling within such a creature of magic. Kara remembered Zed being there at the Mud People's village, and Shota making a brief appearance. But instead of the witch woman coming to offer Kalen the necklace as a wedding gift and truce, Kara only recalled Shota being there to congratulate Richard on stopping the plague by going to the Temple of the Winds. When Richard questioned Kara about Wizard Marlin, the assassin Jagang had sent, she clearly remembered him coming to kill Richard, but not any of the parts where Kalin had been involved. When he asked how in the world she thought he could have even gotten to the Temple of the Winds in the first place, or how he had been cured of the plague were it not for Kalin's help, Kara only shrugged and said, Lord Rall, you're a wizard. You know about such things. I don't. 
I'm sorry, but I can't tell you how you manage to accomplish astonishing things with your gift. I don't know how magic works. I only know that you did it. I only remember you doing what you had to do in order to make things work out. And they did, so I must be right. I could no more easily tell you how you healed me. I only know that you used your gift and you did it. You were the magic against magic, as is your duty to us. I simply don't recall this woman being any part of it. For your sake, I wish I did, but I don't. For every single instance where Kalin had been present, Kara remembered it either differently or not at all. For every one of those events, she had an answer to explain it away with an alternate version, or, when that would have been impossible, simply didn't recall what he was talking about. To Richard, there were a thousand little inconsistencies in her version that just didn't add up or make sense. To Kara's mind, it seemed not only simple and clear, but straightforward. To say that it was exasperating trying to convince Kara of the reality of Kalin's existence would not begin to touch the depth of his frustration. Because it was pointless to continue to remember significant events in an effort to try to help her remember, when it never did any good, Richard had lost interest in trying to bring Kara around to reality. She simply didn't recall Kalin. It seemed that her mind had healed over missing chunks of what had really happened. Richard realized that there had to be an actual rational cause, possibly some kind of spell or something, that was altering her memory, altering everyone's memory. He was coming to accept the fact that if that was the case, and it had to be, then there simply was no single event or body of events that he was going to be able to question her about that would bring back Kara's memory. What was worse, he was realizing, was that such attempts to make her or anyone else remember were actually a dangerous distraction from the effort of finding Kalin. Richard glanced back to make sure that Kara was staying close to him on the steep mountainside. One didn't have to go far up in the jagged mountains ringing Agaden Reach to find a cliff to fall off of. With loose scree lurking beneath the coating of fresh snow, it would be easy to lose their footing and tumble down the slope. He didn't want to chance losing contact with Kara in the poor visibility. With the howl of the wind, it would be hard to hear voices calling out if they became separated, and their tracks would be covered over in mere moments by the blowing, drifting snow. When he saw that Kara was within an arm's length, he pushed on ahead into the teeth of the wind. As he went over it all in his mind, it occurred to him that by constantly trying to think of some incident that Kara, or those closest to him, would surely have to remember, he was falling into the trap of devoting his thoughts and efforts to the problem, rather than the solution. Ever since he had been young, Zed had cautioned him to keep his sights on the goal, to think of the solution and not the problem. Richard vowed to himself that he would keep his focus exclusively on the problem and disregard the distractions created by Kalin's disappearance. Kara, Nietzsche, and Victor all had answers to explain away the inconsistencies. None of them remembered the things that Richard knew had happened. By dwelling on the specifics of what he had done with Kalin and going round and round with people over how it was impossible for them to have forgotten such important events, he was only letting the solution slip farther and farther away from him, letting Kalin's life slip farther and farther away from him. He needed to get a grip on his feelings, stop agonizing over the problem, and concentrate exclusively on the solution. But setting his feelings aside was so difficult, it was almost like telling himself to forget Kalin even as he looked for her. Memory had played a central part in his life with her, Going to see Shota only served to bring much of it back to him. He had met Shota for the first time when Kalin had taken him to see the witch woman in order to ask for her help in finding the last missing box of Orden after Dark and Rahl had put them in play. Kalin was inextricably tied to his life in so many ways. He had, in a manner of speaking, known her as a confessor ever since he had been a boy long before he met the woman herself that day in the Heartland Woods. When he had been a boy, George Cipher, the man who had raised him, 
and who Richard had at the time thought was his father, had told him that he had rescued a secret book from great peril by bringing it to Westland. His father had told him that there was grave danger to everyone as long as the book existed, but he couldn't bring himself to destroy the knowledge in it. The only way to eliminate the danger of the book falling into the wrong hands and yet save the knowledge was to commit the book to memory and then burn the book itself. He chose Richard for the prodigious task of memorizing the entire book. Richard's father took him to a secret place deep in the woods and day after day, week after week, watched Richard sit reading the book over countless times as he worked to memorize it. His father never once looked in the book. That was Richard's responsibility. After a long period of reading and memorizing, Richard began to write down what he'd memorized. He would then check it against the book. At first he made a lot of mistakes, but he continually improved. Each time his father burned the papers. Richard repeated the task untold times. His father often apologized for the burden he was placing on Richard, but Richard never resented it. He considered it an honor to be entrusted by his father with such a great responsibility. Even though he was young and didn't understand all of what he read, he was able to grasp what a profoundly important work it was. He also realized that the book involved complex procedures having to do with magic, real magic. In time, Richard eventually wrote the book out from beginning to end a hundred times without error before he was satisfied that he could never forget a single word. He knew not only by the text of the book, but by its idiosyncratic syntax, that any word left out would spell disaster to the knowledge itself. When he assured his father that the entirety of the work was committed to memory, they put the book back in the hiding place in the rocks and left it for three years. After that time, when Richard was beyond his middle teens, they returned one fall day and uncovered the ancient book. His father said that if Richard could write the whole book without a single mistake, they could both be satisfied that it had been learned perfectly, and they would together burn the book. Richard wrote without hesitation from the beginning to the final word. When he checked his work against the book, it confirmed what he already knew. He had not made a single mistake. Together, he and his father built a fire, stacking on more than enough wood until the heat drove them back. His father handed him the book and told him that if he was sure, he should throw the book into the fire. Richard held the book of counted shadows in the crook of his arm, running his fingers over the thick leather cover. He held in his arms not just his father's trust, but the trust of everyone. Feeling the full weight of that responsibility, Richard cast the book into the fire. In that moment, he was no longer a child. When the book burned, it gave off not only heat, but cold, and it released streamers of colored light and phantom forms. Richard knew that for the first time he had actually seen magic, not sleight of hand or the stuff of mysticism, but real magic that existed real magic with its own laws of how it functioned, just like everything else that existed. And some of those laws had been in the book he had memorized. But in the beginning, that day in the woods, when he had been a boy, and for the first time lifted open the cover, Richard had, in a way, met Kalin. The Book of Counted Shadows began with the words, Verification of the truth of the words of the Book of Counted Shadows, if spoken by another rather than read by the one who commands the boxes, can only be ensured by the use of a confessor. Kalin was the last confessor. The day he met her, Richard had been looking for clues to his father's murder. Darken Rahl had put the boxes of Orden in play, and in order to open them he needed the information in the Book of Counted Shadows. He didn't know that by that time, the information existed only in Richard's mind, and that to verify it, he would need a confessor, Kalin. In a way, Richard and Kalin had been bound together by that book and the events surrounding it from the time Richard had first opened the cover and encountered the strange word, confessor. 
When he met Kaylin in the woods that day, it seemed to him that he had always known her. In a way, he had. In a way, she had played a part in his life, been a part of his thoughts ever since he had been a boy. The day he first saw her standing on a path in the Heartland Woods, his life suddenly became whole, even though at the time he had not known that she was the last living confessor. His choice to help her that day had been an act of free will carried out before prophecy had a chance to have its say. Kalin was so much a part of him, so much a part of what was the world to him, what was life to him, that he could not imagine going on without her. He had to find her. The time had come to go beyond the problem and seek the solution. A gust of icy wind made him squint and brought him out of his memories. There, he said, pointing. Kara paused behind him and peered over his shoulder into the swirling snow until she was able to make out the narrow pathway along the edge of the mountainside. When he glanced back, she nodded, letting him know that she saw the path skirting the lower fringe of the snow cap. With the blowing snow starting to pile up, the path had begun to drift over. Richard was eager to get through it and to lower ground. As they went farther, conditions deteriorated, and the only way he could make out the path was by the lay of the land. The snow had a gentle curve to it as the mountainside rose up from below on the left. It leveled out with a slight dip where the path was, and then to the right humped up where the year-round snow rose higher up. As they trudged through the ankle-deep snow, Richard glanced back over his shoulder. This is the highest point. It will start going downhill soon, and then it will get warmer. You mean we'll be back in the rain before we even have a chance to get down to lower altitudes and get warm, she grumbled. That's what you're telling me. Richard understood all too well her discomfort, but could offer no prospect of relief any time soon. I guess so, he said. Suddenly, something small and dark skittered down out of the white curtains of snow. Just as he saw it, and before he had a chance to react, it knocked Richard's feet right out from under him. Chapter 38 Richard saw the ground flash past his face as his legs flipped up in the air, then all he could see was white. For an instant he couldn't tell up from down or where he was in relation to anything else. And then his full weight came crashing to the ground, the momentum pitching him down the slope. The snow offered little cushion. His breath was driven from his lungs. Rolling over and over, he saw only brief glimpses of the ground. The world spun crazily. He couldn't control or stop what he quickly realized was his tumbling descent down an increasingly steep slope. It had all happened so unexpectedly and so fast that Richard hadn't had much time to brace for the fall. At that moment, inattention seemed a poor excuse and no comfort. He bounced over a knob of hard ground and landed on his chest. With the wind knocked out of him, he tried to gasp a breath as he slid face first down the mountain, but instead of air, he got only a mouthful of icy snow. With the force of the fall and the precipitous angle of the incline, there was nothing at hand to help stop him as he skidded with increasing speed down the steep incline. Heading downward face first made it all the more difficult to take effective action. In a frantic attempt to stop or at least slow his fall, Richard spread his arms. He fought to dig his hands and feet into the snow and scree to slow his out-of-control plunge down the side of the mountain but the snow in the scree only began to slide along with him. He saw a shadow flash by. Over the sound of the wind, he could hear wild screams of rage. Something solid slammed into the back of his ribs. He dug his fingers and boots deeper into the scree beneath the snow, trying to slow his frightening slide. With the snow billowing up around him as he slid, he couldn't see anything but white. The dark shape again came flying out of the swirling snow. Again, something hammered into him, only this time it was much harder, and it was a direct blow to his kidneys, meant to help accelerate his plunging fall. Richard cried out with a shock of pain. 
As he twisted in distress onto his right side, he heard the unique ring of steel as the sword of truth was yanked from its scabbard. As he slid down the slope, Richard twisted and reached for the sword as it was torn away from him. He knew that if he were to grab the razor-sharp blade itself, it could easily slice his hand in two, so he tried instead to seize the hilt, or at least snag the cross guard, but he was too late. The assailant dug in his heels to stop himself as Richard sailed out of sight. Twisting awkwardly as he reached for his sword left Richard even more off balance. As he bounced over the uneven ground, he was thrown into a head-first roll. In the middle of pitching over, just as he started spreading his arms and legs to stop the tumbling, if nothing else, his back slammed into a jut of rock under the snow. Again, the wind was violently driven from him, only this time more painfully. The force of the impact flipped him over the obstruction. Tingling dread surged through him as he found himself in midair. With frantic effort, Richard reached out and snatched the rock outcropping he had hit. He held fast as his legs whipped out and over a drop-off. Richard clutched the rock with frantic strength. For a moment, he clung to the rock, collecting his wits and gulping air. He had at least stopped falling. Snow and small flakes of scree still sliding down the steep slope bounced off the rock he was holding, as well as his arms and head. Carefully, he swung his legs all around, trying to catch them up onto something, trying to find some support for his weight. There was nothing. He swung helplessly, a living pendulum clutching a knob of icy rock. He glanced over his shoulder and saw blowing snow and dark clouds scudding by underneath him. Through a brief gap, he spotted bits of scree in the midst of a long fall through the air toward trees and rock far below. Above him, feet spread, stood a short, dark form with long arms, a pallid head, and gray skin, bulging yellow eyes like twin lanterns glowing out from the murky, bluish light of the snowstorm glared down at him. Bloodless lips curled back in a grin to expose sharp teeth. It was Shota's companion, Samuel. He was gripping Richard's sword in one hand and looked more than content with himself. Samuel wore a dark brown cloak that flapped like a flag of victory in the wind. He backed away a few paces, waiting to see Richard fall from the mountain. Richard's fingers were slipping. He tried to get his arms around the rocks to climb up or at least get a better hold. He wasn't successful. He knew, though, that if he did manage to get a better hold, Samuel stood ready to use the sword to ensure that Richard fell. With his feet dangling over a drop of at least a thousand feet, Richard was in a very precarious and vulnerable position. He could hardly believe that Samuel had gotten the better of him in such a way, and that he had managed to snatch Richard's sword. He surveyed the gloomy gray trailers of fog carried along with the blowing snow but he didn't see Kara. Samuel, Richard screamed into the wind. Give me back my sword. Even to himself, it seemed a pretty ridiculous demand. My sword, Samuel hissed. And what do you think Shota would say? The bloodless lips widened with his smile. Mistress, not here. Like a wraith, Materializing out of the substance of the shadows themselves, a dark shape appeared behind Samuel. It was Kara, her dark cloak billowing in the wind, giving her the aspect of a vengeful spirit. Richard realized that she had probably followed his rolling trail down through the snow. What with the blustery wind in his ears, and more importantly, his gaze riveted on Richard's predicament, Samuel didn't notice Kara looming behind him. In a single glance, she took in the ominous sight of Samuel gripping Richard's sword, standing above Richard as he clung to the edge of the cliff. Richard had learned in the past that Samuel's attention and actions were pretty firmly ruled by his rampant emotions. His feet just followed. With the gleeful distraction of having the object of his rabid hatred at the point of a sword he'd once carried and to this day coveted, 
Samuel was too busy gloating to watch for the moored Sith showing up behind him. Without a word, Kara unceremoniously rammed her Aegeal into the base of Samuel's neck at the back of his skull. With the slippery conditions, she couldn't maintain the contact. Samuel shrieked in pain and sudden confused terror as he dropped the sword and toppled back into the snow. Writhing in agony, not understanding what had happened, he pawed frantically at the back of his neck where Kara had pressed her Aegeal. He squealed as he flopped in the snow like a fish in sand. Richard knew that the horrifying shock of pain from an Aegeal when applied in that spot felt like a lightning strike. Richard recognized the look on Kara's face as she started to lean over the squirming figure. She intended to use her Aegeal to finish Samuel. Richard wouldn't really care if she killed the treacherous companion to the witch woman, but he had far more urgent problems right then. Kara, I'm hanging on the edge of a cliff. I can't hold on. I'm slipping. She immediately snatched up the sword from beside a thrashing Samuel so that he couldn't get at it as she ran to help Richard. Stabbing the blade in the ground beside herself, she dropped down, braced her boots against the rocks, and seized his arms. She had not been an instant too soon. With her help, Richard was able to get a better grip on the rocks. With both of them struggling in the difficult conditions, he at last managed to hook his arm over the outcropping. Once he had a firm hold with an arm, he was finally able to swing a leg up and hook it over the rocks. Kara grabbed his belt and helped haul him up. Straining with effort, he dragged himself up and over the slippery outcropping. Richard sagged over onto his side, gasping, trying to get enough of the thin air. Thanks, he managed. Kara glanced back over her shoulder, keeping an eye on Samuel. Richard quickly gathered his strength and staggered back to his feet. As soon as he had his footing at the brink of the cliff, he pulled up his sword from where Kara had stuck it in the ground. He could hardly believe that Samuel had managed to catch him off guard that way. Ever since Richard and Kara had left their camp that morning, he'd been watching for Samuel to show up unexpectedly. He knew, though, that despite expecting such an attack, it was impossible to forestall it every moment, much as it had been impossible to stop every arrow that morning that Kalen had disappeared. Richard brushed some of the snow off his face. The tumbling fall, the sudden plunge, and hanging by his fingers over a cliff had left him shaken but more than anything, angry. Samuel, still lying crumpled in the snow, wriggling and squirming, puled to himself, mumbling something Richard couldn't hear over the sound of the wind. When Samuel saw Richard stalking toward him, he scrambled awkwardly to his feet, still suffering from the lingering pain. Despite that pain, though, he saw what he wanted. Mine, gimme. Gimme my sword. Richard lifted the point toward the disgusting little fellow. Seeing the point of the blade approaching, Samuel lost his courage and scuttled a few steps backward up the slope. Please, he whined, holding his hands out to ward Richard's wrath. No kill me. What are you doing here? Mistress sends me. Shota sent you to kill me, did she? Richard mocked. He wanted Samuel to admit the truth. Samuel vigorously shook his head. No, not to kill you. So then that was all your idea. Samuel didn't answer. Why then, Richard pressed, why did Shota send you? Samuel eyed Kara as she moved to the side, halfway hemming him in. Samuel hissed at her, showing his teeth. Kara, unimpressed, showed him her Aegeal. His eyes grew big with fear. Samuel, Richard yelled. Samuel's yellow eyes turned back to Richard, and they again turned hateful. Why did Shota send you? Mistress, he whimpered as his anger flagged. He stared off longingly in the direction of Agaden Reach. She sends companion. Why? Samuel flinched when Richard yelled and took an aggressive stride forward. Samuel, trying to keep watch on both of them, 
pointed a long finger at Kara. Mistress say for you to bring pretty lady. This was a surprise for two reasons. Pretty lady was what Samuel had always called Kalen. Secondly, Richard would never have expected that Shota would want Kara to come down into Agaden Reach with him. He found that somehow troubling. Why does she want the pretty lady to come with me? Don't know, Samuel's bloodless lips pulled back in a grin. Maybe to kill her. Kara waggled her Aegeal for him to see. If she tries, maybe she will get a lot more than you got. Maybe I'll kill her instead. Samuel squealed in horror, his bulging eyes going wide. No, no kill, mistress. We didn't come to harm Shota, Richard told him, but we will defend ourselves. Samuel pressed his knuckles to the ground as he leaned toward Richard. We will see, he growled with contempt, what mistress does with you, seeker. Before Richard could answer, Samuel suddenly darted off into the swirling snow. It was surprising how fast he could move. Kara stared after him, but Richard caught her arm to stop her. I'm in no mood to go running after him, he said. Besides, it's unlikely we'll catch him. He knows the trail, and we aren't familiar with it. We can't follow his tracks as fast as he can make them. Besides, he will be heading back to Shota, and that's where we're going anyway. No use to waste our energy when we'll catch up with him in the end. You should have let me kill him. Richard started up the slope toward the trail. I would have, but I can't fly. I suppose, she conceded with a sigh. Are you all right? Richard nodded as he slid the sword home into its scabbard, putting away, too, the flush of hot anger. Thanks to you. Kara flashed him a self-satisfied smile. I keep telling you you couldn't get along without me. She glanced around in the gray-blue murk. What if he tries that again? Samuel is basically a coward and an opportunist. He only attacks when he thinks you're helpless. He is without any redeeming qualities as far as I can tell. Why would the witch woman keep him around? I don't know. Maybe he's just a sycophant and she enjoys the groveling. Maybe she lets him stay around to run errands for her. Maybe Samuel is the only one who would willingly be her companion. Most people are terrified of Shota, and from what I hear, no one will come near this place. Although, from what Kalin told me, witch women can't help bewitching people. It's just the way they are. Even if they didn't, Shota is certainly seductive in her own right, so I imagine that if she really wanted a worthwhile companion, she could have her pick. Now that we've driven him off, I really doubt that Samuel would have the courage to attack again. He's delivered Shota's message. Now that we've scared him and hurt him, he will probably want to run back to Shota's protection. Besides, he probably thinks she may kill us, and he'd be just as happy to have her do it. Kara stared off into the swirling snow for a moment before following Richard up the steep slope. Why do you think Shota would send a messenger? to make sure that I come with you down into Agaden Reach. Richard found the trail and started down it. He saw Samuel's footprints, but they were already filling in with the blowing snow. I don't know. That part has me puzzled. And why does Samuel think that your sword belongs to him? Richard slowly let out a deep breath. Samuel carried the sword before me. He was the last seeker before me although not a legitimately named seeker. I don't know how he acquired the Sword of Truth. Zed came into Agaden Reach and took it back. Samuel believes that the sword still belongs to him. Kara looked incredulous. He was the last seeker? Richard cast her a meaningful look. He didn't have the magic, the temperament, or the character required by the sword to be the true seeker of truth. Because he wasn't able to be the master of the sword's power, that power changed him into what you see today. Chapter 39 With one finger, Richard swiped the sweat and drizzle from his brow. 
Little light penetrated the gloom at the lower stories of the swamp, but even without the sun beating down on them, the steamy heat was oppressive. After coming down from the storm raging up in the mountain pass, Richard didn't mind the heat so much as he otherwise might have. Kara wasn't complaining either, but then she rarely did about her own discomfort. As long as she was near him, she was satisfied, although whenever he did anything she considered risky, it did tend to make her ill-tempered, which explained her irritable disposition about going to see Shota. Here and there in the mud and soft ground of the forest floor, Richard saw fresh footprints left by Samuel. It was clear to Richard that Shota's companion had been eager to get back to her protection and had hurried along the trail at a constant lope. Kara, too, saw the tracks. Richard had been impressed when she had pointed them out when she'd first spotted them. She had been more observant of tracks ever since the day Kalin had disappeared and Richard had shown her, Nietzsche, and Victor some of the kinds of things that tracks revealed. Even though Samuel's tracks made it clear that he had been rushing and it didn't look like he intended to try to jump them again, Richard and Kara still kept careful watch in case he or anything else were to be lurking in the shadows. The swamp was, after all, a place meant to keep intruders away. Richard wasn't sure just what waited back under cover of leaf and shadow, but people in the Midlands, including wizards, didn't fear to come into Shota's sanctuary without sound reason. It was no longer raining, but as foggy and humid as it was, it might as well have been. The forest canopy collected the mist and drizzle, releasing it as sporadic fat drops. Broad leaves on long arching stalks sprouting up from the tangled growth at the forest floor and vines twisting through the branches of trees all around bobbed under the assault of those heavy drops, giving the whole forest a constant nodding movement in the still air. The trees in the swamp grew in gnarled, twisted shapes, as if tormented by the load of vines and curtains of moss that hung limp and heavy from their branches in the mist. Crusty lichen, and in places black slime, grew on the bark. Here and there in the distance, Richard spotted birds perched on the branches, watching. Vapor hovered just above the surface of stagnant expanses of murky water runoff collected in the lap of the mountains. At the water's edge, tangles of roots snaked down into the depths. Things moved through the dark pools, lifting the film of duckweed on the slow rolling waves. From the shadows back across the water, eyes watched. All around, the cacophonous calls of birds rang through the damp air, while Richard and Kara had to swish at the bugs buzzing around them. Other animals back in the mist let out whoops and whistles. At the same time, the thick, still vegetation and the oppressive, muggy weight of the air lent the place a kind of uneasy stillness. Richard saw Kara wrinkle her nose at the pervasive, rotting stench. The path through the dense growth almost seemed more like a living, growing tunnel. Richard was glad they didn't have to venture off the trail and back into the surrounding quagmire. He could imagine all too well claws and fangs waiting patiently for dinner to happen by. When they reached the brink of the gloomy swamp, Richard paused in the deep shadows. Peering out of the dark tangle of branches, hanging moss and clinging green growth was like looking out from a cave at a glorious new day beyond. Despite the drizzle and mist up in the swamp, the late-day sun had broken through the cloud cover in places to cast golden shafts of sunlight on the distant valley as if it were a jewel on display. Around the verdant valley, the rocky gray walls of the surrounding mountains ascended almost straight up into a dark rim of clouds. As far as Richard knew, there was no way into Shota's home but through the swamp, the valley floor below was spread with a rolling carpet of grasses dotted with wildflowers. Stands of oak, maple, and beech mottled some of the hills and congregated in low places along the stream, their leaves shimmering in the late light. In the dark forest where Richard and Kara stood, it felt like standing in night looking out on day. 
Not far off through the vines and brush, water tumbled off the craggy rock at the edge of the swamp to disappear into vertical columns of mist on its way down to the clear pools and streams far below, where it made a distant roar that, at their height, sounded like little more than a hiss. That spray and mist wet their faces as they gazed off the edge of the cliff. Richard led Kara through a narrow path off the main trail that simply ended at the cliff. The small side track would be nearly impossible to find had he not known where to look for it from his previous visit. It passed through a maze of boulders nearly hidden beneath a layer of pale green ferns. Vines, moss, and brush also helped conceal the obscure route. At the edge, they finally began the descent. The trail down into the valley in large part was made up of steps, thousands of them, cut from the stone of the cliff wall itself. Those steps twisted and tunneled and turned ever downward, following the natural shape of the tiers of rock, sometimes following around soaring natural stone columns only to spring back on themselves to pass underneath the pathway bridging above. The view on the way down the side of the cliff was spectacular. The streams carrying mountain runoff meandering through gentle hills were as beautiful as any Richard had ever seen. The trees in places gathered into bands and another spot standing alone as a single monarch atop a hill were as calm and inviting a sight as he could hope for. In the distant center of the valley, set among a carpet of grand trees, was a beautiful palace of breathtaking grace and splendor. Delicate spires stretched into the air, wispy bridges spanned the high gaps between towers, and stairs spiraled around turrets. Colorful flags and streamers flew atop every point. If a majestic palace could be said to look feminine, this one did. It seemed a fitting place for a woman like Shota. Other than his home of Heartland and the mountains to the west of there, where he had taken Kalin to recover over the span of a magical summer, Richard had never seen another place to compare to this valley. That alone had given him pause in his judgment about Shota before he'd met her for the first time. Passing through the swamp back then, he had thought it a fitting place for a witch to live, when he had been told that the valley was actually her home, he had thought that surely someone who could call such a peaceful, beautiful place home had to have some good qualities. Later, when he had seen the beauty of the people's palace, Dark and Rawl's home, he came to discount such indulgent notions. At the bottom of the cliff beside the waterfall, a road led off through grassy fields to wind its way among the small hills. Before they took to the road, though, Kara asked if they could take the opportunity for a quick dip to get clean. Richard thought it sounded like a good idea, so he stopped and took off his pack. Most importantly, he wanted to wash the painful burns so they would have a better chance to heal. He was drenched in sweat and filth and imagined that he must look like a beggar. Kaylin had told him once that it was important to convey the proper impression to people she had wanted him to come up with something better than his woods guide attire. At the time, she had been trying to tell him that if he expected people to believe in him and follow him, if he was to be the Lord Rall and command the Daharan Empire, he had to look the part. Appearance, after all, was a reflection on what a person thought of themselves, and therefore, by extension, of others. A person crippled by self-loathing or self-doubt reflected those feelings in their appearance. Such visual clues did not inspire confidence in others because, and while not always completely accurate, for the most part they did reflect the inner person, whether or not that person realized it. No self-respecting bird in good health would allow its feathers to look ruffled. No confident cougar would let its fur long remain matted and dirty. A statue meant to represent the nobility of man did not convey that concept by portraying him disheveled and dirty. Richard had understood Kalin's point, and in fact had already begun to see to it before she mentioned it. He had found most of an outfit 
from a former war wizard up in the wizard's keep. He used the important elements of that outfit and had some other things made. He didn't know how it impressed other people, but he remembered quite clearly how it had impressed Kalin. Richard went around the rocks at the bottom of the waterfall to find a private place for a quick wash, while Kara picked another spot for herself. She promised that she wouldn't be long. The water felt soothing, but Richard didn't want to waste any time. He had a lot more important matters on his mind. Once rinsed clean of sweat and grime, and after cleaning the burns, he put on his war wizard's outfit, which he had pulled from his pack. He thought that today of all days would be the proper day to appear to Shota as a leader come to speak with her, rather than a helpless beggar. Over black trousers and a black sleeveless shirt, he put on his black open-sided tunic, decorated with symbols snaking along a wide gold band running all the way around its squared edges. A wide, multi-layered leather belt bearing a number of silver emblems and ancient designs held a gold-worked pouch to each side and cinched the tunic at his waist. Pins on the leather lashing around the tops of his black boots also carried those symbols. He carefully placed the ancient tooled leather baldric holding the polished gold and silver wrought scabbard over his right shoulder and attached the Sword of Truth at his left hip. While to most people the Sword of Truth was an awesome weapon, and it certainly was that, it was much more to Richard. His grandfather, Zed, in his capacity as first wizard, had given the sword to Richard, naming him Seeker. In many ways, that trust was much the same as his father's trust had been in asking him to memorize the book. It had taken Richard a long time to come to fully understand all that the trust and responsibility of carrying the sword of truth meant. As a formidable weapon, the sword had saved his life countless times but it had not saved his life because it came with redoubtable power or because it was capable of remarkable feats. It had saved his life because it had helped him learn things not just about himself, but about life. To be sure, the Sword of Truth had taught him about fighting, about the dance with death, and how to prevail against seemingly impossible odds. And while it had helped him when he had to carry out that most terrible of all acts, killing, it had also helped him learn when forgiveness was justified. In those ways, it had helped him come to understand what values were important in helping to advance the cause of life itself. And it had helped him learn the importance and necessity of judging those values and of how to put each in context. In some ways, like the way that learning the Book of Counted Shadows had taught him that he was no longer a child, the sword had helped him learn to be a part of the wider world and his place in it. It had, in a way, also brought him Kalin. And Kalin was why he needed to see Shota. Richard closed the flap on his pack. There was a cape, looking like it had been spun from gold, that he'd found with the rest of the war wizard's outfit up in the keep. But since it was such a warm day, he left that in the pack. Finally, on each wrist, he put on a wide, leather-padded silver band bearing linked rings encompassing more of the ancient symbols. Among other things, those ancient bands were used to call the slip from her sleep. When Kara called out that she was ready, Richard lifted his pack and made his way around the rocks. He saw then why she had wanted to stop. She had done more than simply take a quick bath. She had put on her red leather outfit. Richard cast a meaningful glance at the moored Sith's blood-red uniform. Shota may be sorry she invited you to the party. Kara's smile said that if there was any trouble, she would see to it. As they started down the road, Richard said, I don't know exactly what powers Shota has, but I think that maybe you should try something today that you have never tried before. Kara frowned. What would that be? Caution. Chapter 40 Richard scanned the surrounding hills, watching for any sign of danger, 
as he and Kara entered a place where the magnificent beech and maple trees had grown clustered together at the top of a rise. The straight, tall trunks forked ever wider in gentle ascending arcs, giving Richard the sense of massive columns holding up the vaulted ceiling of a great green cathedral. The fragrance of wildflowers drifted in on a gentle breeze. Through the canopy of rustling leaves, he could get tantalizing glimpses of the soaring spires of Shota's palace. Streamers of golden sunlight flickered through the leaves and cavorted around on the low grass. Water from a spring burbled up through an opening in a low boulder and ran down its smooth sides into a shallow, meandering stream. Spread through the stream were rocks covered with a coat of fuzzy green moss. A woman with a thick mane of blonde hair and wearing a long black dress sat in the dappled sunlight on a rock beside the stream, leaning on one graceful arm as she ran her fingers through the clear water. She seemed to glow. The very air around her seemed to glow. Even with her back to him, she looked all too familiar. Page 391. Kara leaned toward Richard and spoke in a confidential tone. Is that Nietzsche? In a way, I wish it were, but it isn't. Are you sure? Richard nodded. I've seen Shota do this before. The first time I ever saw her, in that exact same place, she appeared to me as my deceased mother. Kara glanced over at him. That's a rather cruel deception. She said that it was a gift a kindness meant only to briefly bring a cherished memory to life. Kara huffed skeptically. So why would she be trying to make you remember Nietzsche? Richard looked over at Kara, but didn't have an answer for her. When they finally reached the rock, the woman gracefully rose and turned to him. Blue eyes he knew met his gaze. Richard, the woman who looked like Nietzsche said, her voice had the exact same silken quality as Nietzsche's. The low neckline of the laced bodice seemed to Richard to be cut even lower than he recalled. I'm so pleased to see you again. She rested her wrists on his shoulders, casually locking her fingers together behind his head. The air around her seemed filmy, giving her a soft, blurred, surreal appearance. So very pleased she added with breathless affection. She could not have looked or sounded any more like Nietzsche if it had been Nietzsche herself. The illusion was so convincing that Kara stood with her jaw hanging. Richard almost felt a sense of relief at seeing Nietzsche again. Almost. Shota, I've come to talk with you. Talk is for lovers, she said, a coy smile seeping through her exquisite features. She slipped her fingers into the hair at the back of his head as her soft smile warmed affectionately. Her eyes, joining in her smile, reflected her delight at seeing him. She seemed at that moment more pleased, more quietly satisfied, more at peace than he had ever seen Nietzsche look. She also looked so much like Nietzsche that he was having trouble convincing himself to keep in mind that it was Shota. If nothing else, she acted far more in character with Shota than with Nietzsche. Nietzsche would never be so forward. It had to be Shota. She gently pulled him closer. At that moment, Richard had trouble trying to think of a reason to resist. None came presently to mind. He couldn't stop gazing into her alluring eyes. He felt himself being swept away with the simple pleasure of gazing at Nietzsche's entrancing face. And if that is your offer, Richard, then I accept. She had drifted so close to him that he could feel the sweet breath of her words on his face. Her eyes closed. Her soft lips met his in a slow, luxurious kiss that he did not return. Nonetheless, he didn't force her away either. As her arms drew him tighter into the embrace, into the kiss, it seemed to scramble his thinking and completely immobilize him. Even more than the kiss, that embrace awakened a terrible longing for the comfort of steadfast support, sheltering devotion, and tender acceptance. 
More than anything, the promise of that long absent solace was what disarmed him. He could feel every inch, every curve, every rise and fall of her firm body pressing against his. He knew that he was trying to think of something other than that kiss, that embrace, that body, but he couldn't for the life of him remember what it was. In fact, he was having a great deal of difficulty making himself think at all. It was because of that kiss. It was a kiss that made him forget who he was or why he was here, even though, oddly enough, it didn't seem to be a kiss that necessarily promised love or even lust. He wasn't sure what it promised. It almost seemed to be conditional. One thing he did know was that it was very different from the kiss Nietzsche had given him back in the stable in Altuorong just before he'd left. That kiss had carried the extraordinary pleasure and serenity of magic, if not other things. The real Nietzsche had been behind that kiss. Despite the visual illusion, this was not Nietzsche. This was a kiss that seemed irresistible, as a great weight might be irresistible, but not really all that erotic. Even so, it threatened to tangle him up in its cautious questions and silent promises. Nietzsche, or Shota, or whoever you are, Kara growled through clenched teeth, fists at her sides. Just what do you think you're doing? She pulled away, turning her head slightly, her cheek resting against Richard's, to gaze curiously at Kara. Delicate fingers idly twined their way through the hair at the back of his head, Richard's mind was reeling. Kara backed away a bit as Shota in Nietzsche's skin, with her other hand, tenderly cupped the moored Sith's chin. Why? Nothing more than what you want. Kara backed another step so that her face would be out of range of the comforting hand. What? This is what you want, isn't it? I would think that you would be grateful that I'm helping you with your grand plan. Kara planted her fists on her hips. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. Why so angry? The smile turned sly. I didn't come up with this. You did. This is your plan, the one you hatched all by yourself. I'm simply helping you bring it to life. What makes you think... Kara seemed to run out of words. The blue-eyed gaze that looked so much like Nietzsche's slid to Richard. The smile returned as she studied his features from only inches away. This young woman is such a dear friend and loyal protector. Has your dear friend and loyal protector told you what she has all planned out for you, Richard? She touched his nose. Such plans they are, too. She has the rest of your life all thought out and arranged for you. You really should ask her sometime what she is plotting for you. Kara's face suddenly went slack with understanding, and then it went crimson. Richard grasped Shota by the shoulders and eased her back, forcing her hand to slip off his shoulder. At the same time, he renewed his efforts to regain control of himself. You've already said it. Kara is my friend. I do not fear what she may want for my life. You see, despite what friends and loved ones want for me or hope I will achieve, it's my life and I decide what I will try to make of it. People can plan or hope all they want for those they care about, but in the end it is each individual who must take responsibility for their own life and make the choice for themselves. Her wide smile showed her teeth. How deliciously innocent you are to think such things. Her fingers combed back his hair. I would strongly advise you to ask her what she is plotting to do with your heart. Richard glanced to Kara. She looked at the same time on the verge of both exploding in rage and fleeing in panic. Instead of either, she stood her ground and kept quiet. Richard didn't know what Shota was talking about, but he did know that this was not the time or place to find out. He couldn't allow Shota to lead him away from his purpose. He also noticed that Kara had a white-knuckled fist around her aegeal. Shota, enough of this charade. Kara's wishes and intentions are my concern, not yours. Nietzsche smiled sadly. So you think, Richard. So you think. The hazy air around the woman shimmered, and Nietzsche was no longer Nietzsche, but Shota. 
She was no longer a dreamy phantasm, but a clear vision. Her hair, instead of blonde, was just as thick, but a wavy auburn. Her black dress had changed into a wispy, variegated gray layered affair, cut just as low, with loose points that lifted ever so slightly in the breeze. She was every bit as beautiful as the valley around her. As Shota turned her attention to Kara, her expression tightened dangerously. You hurt Samuel. I'm sorry, Kara said with a shrug. I didn't mean to hurt him. Shota arched an eyebrow over her threatening glare, as if to say she didn't believe a word of it. I meant to kill him, Kara said. Shota's anger melted away. An incandescent smile accompanied a genuine, if brief, laugh. She regarded Richard with a sidelong glance, the smile still on her lips. I like her. You can keep her. Richard recalled that Kara had once made that very same pronouncement to him about Kalin. Shota, I told you, I have to talk to you. Her bright, clear almond eyes took him in with a sense of wonder. So, you have come offering to be my lover? Richard noticed Samuel off through the trees, watching, his yellow eyes glowing with hatred. You know I haven't. Ah, her smile returned. What you mean to say, then, is that you have come because you want something from me. She caught one of the floating points of her dress. Isn't that right, Richard? Richard had to remind himself to stop staring into her ageless eyes. But it was so hard to make himself glance away. It was as if Shota controlled where his gaze rested, and he was having trouble keeping it resting in the proper places. Kalin had told him once that Shota had been bewitching him. Kalin said that Shota couldn't help it. It was just what witch women did. It came naturally to them. Kalin. That thought of her again jolted his mind. Kalin is missing. Shota's brow wrinkled ever so slightly. Who? Richard sighed. Look, something terrible is going on. Kalin, my wife. Wife? Since when did you take a wife? Her expression curdled into a heated glare. By the sudden anger powering her features and the way her cleavage heaved at the brink of the low-cut dress, Richard knew that she was not feigning surprise. She truly didn't remember Kalen. Richard ran his own fingers back through his hair as he gathered his thoughts and started again. Shota, you've met Kalen several times. You know her quite well. Something has happened to erase everyone's memory of her. No one remembers her, you included. And except you, she said with incredulity. You alone remember her? It's a long story. Length won't make it true. It is true, Richard insisted. He gestured heatedly. You were at our wedding. She folded her arms. I don't think so. The first time I came here, you had captured Kalen and had covered her in snakes. Snakes? Shota smiled. You're saying I liked this woman and are suggesting that I treated her indulgently? Not exactly. You wanted her dead. The smile widened. She returned her wrists to his shoulders. Now, Richard, that's awfully harsh, don't you think? Richard grasped her by the waist and gently moved her back. He knew that if he didn't stop her, she would soon hamper his ability to think. I certainly thought so, he said. Among other things, you didn't want us to wed. Shota ran a red, lacquered nail down his chest. She looked up at him from under her brow. Well, maybe I had my reasons. Yes, you didn't want us to bring a child into the world. You said we would be creating a monster, because from me it would have the gift, and from Kalin it would be a confessor. Confessor? Shota took a step back as if he had turned poisonous. A confessor? Are you out of your mind? Shota, there aren't any more confessors. They're all dead. That's not quite accurate. All of them are dead except Kalin. She turned to Kara. 
Has he had a fever or something? Well, he was shot with an arrow. He nearly died. Nietzsche healed him, but he was still unconscious for days. Shota suspiciously held up a finger, as if she had uncovered a devious plot. Don't tell me. She used subtractive magic. Yes, she did, Richard answered in Kara's place. And because she did, she was able to save my life. Shota took back the step she had put between them when she had retreated. Used subtractive magic, Shota muttered to herself. She looked up at him again. How did she use it? For what purpose? She used it to eliminate the barbed arrow embedded in me. Shota rolled a hand, wanting him to continue. She must have done something more. She used subtractive magic to purge all the blood pooling in my chest. She said that there was no other way to get either the arrow or the blood out of me, and either would kill me if left in. Shota turned her back to them, and, one hand on a hip, walked off a few paces as she considered the brief account. That explains a great many things, she said unhappily under her breath. You gave Kalin a necklace, Richard said. Shota frowned back over her shoulder. A necklace? What sort of necklace would I give her? And why, my dear boy, do you imagine I would ever do such a thing for your lover? Wife, Richard corrected. You and Kalin had spent time together by yourselves and had come to an understanding of sorts. You gave the necklace to Kalin as a gift so that she and I could, well, be together. It had some kind of power so that we wouldn't conceive children. While I don't agree with your view of future events, right now, what with the war and all, we decided to accept your gift and the truce that went with it. I can't imagine how you could possibly imagine that I would do any of those things. Shota looked to Kara again. Did he have a bad fever on top of the injury? Richard might have thought that Shota was being sarcastic, but he could see by the look on her face that she was asking a serious question. Not exactly a bad fever, Kara said hesitantly. It was a slight fever. Nietzsche said, though, that his problem was partly with how close he came to death, but mostly had to do with the extended time that he was unconscious. Kara sounded rather reluctant to speak about it to a person she considered a potential threat, but she at last finished her answer. She said that he was suffering from delirium. Shota folded her arms as she heaved a sigh while taking him in with her almond eyes. What am I to do with you, she murmured half to herself. The last time I was here, Richard said, you told me that if I ever came back into Agaden Reach, you would kill me. She showed no reaction. Did I now? And why would I say such a thing? I guess you were rather angry with me for refusing to kill Kalin and for refusing to allow you to do it. He pointed with his chin back up toward the mountain pass. I thought you might have meant to keep your word, and so you sent Samuel to fulfill your threat. Shota glanced to her companion off through the trees. He looked suddenly alarmed. What are you talking about? She asked with a frown as she looked back at Richard. Are you claiming you didn't know? No, what? Richard briefly considered the angry yellow eyes glaring at him. Samuel hid up in the pass and jumped me from out of the storm. He snatched my sword and kicked me over a cliff. I just managed to catch the edge. If Kara wouldn't have been there, Samuel would have used the sword to see to it that I fell from the cliff. He very nearly killed me. That he didn't wasn't because he didn't intend to or try his best. Shota's glare glided to the dark figure crouched off in the trees. Is that true? Samuel could not bear her scrutiny. Puling with self-pity, his gaze sank to the ground. That was answer enough. We will discuss this later, she told him in a low voice that carried unequivocally through the trees and gave Richard goosebumps. That was not my intention, Richard, nor my orders, I can assure you. 
I told Samuel only to invite your devious little guardian to come along. You know what, Shota? I'm getting pretty tired of Samuel trying to kill me and you then claiming that you never gave him any such instructions. One might have been credible, but it's growing too routine. Your innocent surprise every time it happens is beginning to strike me as rather convenient. It appears to me that you find deniability quite useful, and so you stick to it. That isn't true, Richard, Shota said in a measured tone. She unfolded her arms and clasped her hands as she looked at the ground at her feet. You carry his sword. Samuel is a little touchy about that. Since it was taken from him, not given freely, that means it still belongs to him. Richard nearly objected, but then reminded himself that he wasn't there to argue the point. Shota's gaze rose to meet his. It came up angry. And how dare you complain to me about what Samuel does without my knowledge when you knowingly bring a deadly menace into the peace of my home? Richard was taken aback. What are you talking about? Don't play stupid, Richard. It doesn't fit you. You are hunted by a wildly dangerous threat. How many people have already died because they were unfortunate enough to be near you when the beast came looking for you? What if it decides to come here to kill you? You come here, and in so doing, cavalierly risk my life without my permission, simply because you happen to want something? Do you think it's right that I'm put at risk of death because of your wants? Does the fact that you think I have something you need put my life at your disposal and therefore at great risk? Of course not, Richard swallowed. I never looked at it that way. Shota threw her hands up. Ah, so your excuse is that I am to be put in peril because you didn't think. I need your help. You mean you have come as a helpless beggar, begging for help, without regard to the danger it puts me in, simply because you want something? Richard rubbed a fingertip across his forehead. Look, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you that I have good reason to believe that I'm right that Kaelin exists and she has disappeared. Like I said, you want something and you don't bother to consider the risk to anyone else? Richard took a step closer to her. That isn't true, don't you see? You don't remember Kaelin. No one but me does. Think, Shota. Think of what it means if I'm right. Her brow twitched as she puzzled at him. What are you talking about? If I'm right, then there is something gravely wrong in the world that's making everyone, including you, forget her. She has been wiped from your mind. But it's more serious than that. It's not just Kalen that is missing from everyone's mind. Everything that you or anyone else ever did with her is also missing. Some of those missing bits may be trivial, but other parts of it very well could be vital. You don't remember that you said you would kill me if I ever came back here. That means that when you said that, in your mind, that threat had to be somehow connected to Kalen. She contributed to your choice to make that threat. Now, since you don't remember Kalen, you also don't recall saying that to me. What if there's something vastly important that you've likewise forgotten? Because you've forgotten Kalen, you've lost part of what you've done in your own life, lost some of the decisions you've made, how many ways do you have a connection with Kalen that you are completely unaware of that are now wiped away? How important are those missing bits? How much of your life has been altered because you now don't recall the changes in your thinking that you made because of her influence? Shota, don't you see the magnitude of the problem? Can't you fathom how this has the potential to change everyone's perception? If everyone forgets how Kalen changed their individual lives, they will act without the benefit of the shifts they made in their thinking. Richard paced, one hand on a hip, gesturing with the other. Think of someone you know. He turned back to her, meeting her gaze. Think of your mother. Now just try to imagine all that you would lose if you lost every memory of her and everything she taught you every one of your decisions in which she had an influence, both directly and indirectly. 
Now imagine everyone forgetting someone important like your mother was to you. But imagine them being central to events important to everyone. Imagine for a moment how your life, your thinking, would be altered if you forgot that I exist and you no longer recalled the things you've done with me, the things you've done because of me. Can you begin to see the significance? You gave Kaelin that necklace as a wedding gift to both of us to prevent her from conceiving, at least for now. It was a gift that was more than that, though. It was a truce. It was peace between you and me as much as between you and Kaelin. What other truces, alliances, and oaths have been made because of Kaelin that, like the necklace, are now forgotten? How many important missions will be abandoned? Don't you see? This holds the potential to throw the world into turmoil. I have no idea of the possible effects of such a wide-ranging event, but for all I know, it could alter the complexion of the fight for freedom. It could usher in the dawn of the imperial order. For all I know, it could usher in the end of life itself. Shota looked astonished. Life itself? Something this significant does not happen randomly. It's not an unfortunate accident or some casual mistake. There has to be a cause, and anything that could cause a universal event of this enormity carries sinister implications. For a time, Shota regarded him with an unreadable expression. She finally caught a floating corner of the layered material that made up her dress and turned away as she thought about his words. Finally, she turned back. And what if you are simply suffering from a delusion? Since that is the simplest explanation that makes it most likely the true answer. While the simplest explanation is usually the true answer, it is not infallibly so. This is no ordinary choice as you paint it, Richard. What you describe is extravagantly complicated. I'm having trouble even beginning to envision the complexities and consequences that would be involved in such an event. It would have to cause so many things to come undone with such compounding disorder that it would soon become all too obvious to everyone that something was terribly wrong in the world, even if they didn't know what. That just isn't happening. Shota swept her arm out in grand fashion. Meanwhile, what damage to the world will you cause because of this mad mission you have undertaken to find a woman who does not exist? You came to me the first time to get help in stopping Dark and Rahl. I helped you, and in so doing I helped you become the Lord Rahl. The war rages on, the Daharan Empire fights desperately on, and now you are not there to be a part of it, as is your place as the Lord Rahl. You have been effectively removed from your position of authority by your own delusions and unthinking actions. A void is left where there should be leadership. All the help you would be able to provide is no longer available to those who fight for the cause you have championed. I believe that I am right, Richard said. If I am, then that means there is a grave danger that no one but me is even aware of. Therefore, no one but me can fight it. Only I stand opposed to some unknown but impending ruin. I can't in good conscience ignore what I believe to be the truth of a hidden threat more monstrous than anyone realizes. That makes a convenient excuse, Richard. It's not an excuse. Shota nodded mockingly. And if the newly founded free empire of Dahara falls in the meantime? If the savages of the Imperial Order raise their bloody swords over the corpses of all those brave men who will perish defending the cause of freedom while their leader is off chasing phantoms? Will all those brave men be any less dead because you alone see some inscrutable danger? Will their cause, will your cause, be any less ended? Will the world then be able to slide merrily into a long, dark age where millions upon millions will be born into miserable lives of oppression, starvation, suffering, and death? Will chasing after the enigma in your mind alone make liberty's grave acceptable to you, Richard? A mere consequence of what you stubbornly think is right in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary? 
Richard had no answer. In fact, he feared to even attempt to give her one. After the way she'd put it, anything he said would sound hollow and selfish. He felt sure that he had sound reasons to stick to his convictions, but he also knew that to everyone else the proof had to seem pretty thin, so he thought that maybe it was best to just keep quiet. More than that, though, lurking beneath the surface was the terrible shadow of fear that she could be right, that it was all some dreadful delusion in his mind alone and not some problem with everyone else. What made him right and everyone else wrong? How could he alone be right? How could such a thing even be possible? How could he know himself that he was right? What proof other than his own memory did he have? There was not one concrete shred of evidence that he could hold that he could point to. The crack in his confidence terrified him. If that crack widened, if it ruptured, the weight of the world would crash in and crush him. He couldn't bear that weight if she didn't exist. His word alone stood between Kalin and Oblivion. He couldn't go on without her. He didn't want to go on in a world without her. She was everything to him. Until that moment, he had been pushing her personal, private, intimate, loving memory aside and instead dealing with details in order to endure the pain of missing her for yet another day, even as he worked toward finding her. But that pain was now tightening around his heart, threatening to take him to his knees. With the pain of missing her came a flood of guilt. He was Kalin's only hope. He alone kept the flame of her alive above the torrent, trying to drown out her existence. He alone worked to find her and bring her back. But he had not yet accomplished anything useful toward that end. The days marched past, but so far he hadn't gained anything that would get him any closer to her. To make matters all the worse, Richard knew that Shota was also right in one very important way. While he worked toward helping Kalin, he was failing everyone else. He had been the one who, to a large extent, had made people believe in the idea, the very real possibility, of a free Dahara, of a place where it was possible for people to live and work toward their own goals in their own lives. He was only too aware that he was also largely responsible for the great barrier coming down allowing Emperor Jagang to lead the Imperial Order into the New World to threaten the newfound freedom in the New World. How many people would be at risk or lose their lives while he pursued this one person that he loved? What would Kalin want him to do? He knew how much she cared for the people of the Midlands, the people she had once ruled. She would want him to forget her and to try to save them she would say that there was too much at stake to come after her. But if it was he who was missing, she would not abandon him for anything or anyone. Despite what Kalin might say, it was her life that was important to him, her life that meant the world to him. He wondered if perhaps Shota was right, that he was merely using the concept of the danger Kalin's disappearance represented for the rest of the world as an excuse. He decided that the best thing to do for the moment, until he could think of a better way to get the help he needed and to buy himself time to gather his courage to harden his resolve, was to change the subject. What about this thing? Richard asked, gesturing vaguely. This beast that's chasing me. The passion was gone from his voice. He realized how tired he was from the long trek over the pass to say nothing of the blur of days riding up from the old world. Is there anything you can tell me about it? He felt on safer ground with this question, because the beast could interfere not only with his search for Kalin, but with the mission Shota was urging him to return to. She watched him for a moment, her voice finally coming much softer as had his, as if without realizing it, they had reached a wordless truce to lower the level of antagonism. The beast that hunts you is no longer the beast it once was, the beast it was as it was created. Events have caused it to mutate. Mutate? Kara asked, looking alarmed. What do you mean? What has it become? Shota appraised them both, 
as if to make sure they were paying attention. It has become a blood beast. Chapter 41 A blood beast? Richard asked. Kara moved close to his side. What's a blood beast? Shota took a breath before explaining. It is no longer simply a beast linked to the underworld as it was when it was created. It was inadvertently given a taste of your blood, Richard. What's worse, it was given that taste through subtractive magic, magic also linked to the underworld. That event changed it into a blood beast. So what does that mean? Kara asked. Shota leaned closer, her voice dropping to little more than a whisper. That means that it is now oh so much more dangerous. She straightened after she was sure she had made the intended impression. I'm not an expert on ancient weapons created in the Great War, but I believe that once such a beast as this one has tasted the blood of its mark in such a way there is no turning it back, ever. All right, so it won't give up. Richard rested his palm on the hilt of his sword. What can you tell me to help me kill it then? Or at least stop it or send it back to the underworld? What does it do precisely? How does it know that... No, no, Shota waved a dismissive hand. You are trying to think of this in terms of some ordinary threat hunting you. You're trying to put a nature to it, trying to give it a defining behavior. It has none. That is the peculiarity of this thing, the absence of a defining description, of a makeup, at least one that is of any use, since its nature is precisely that it has none. Because of that, it therefore cannot be predicted. That makes no sense, Richard folded his arms, wondering if Shota really knew as much about this beast as she said she did. It has to function by some fundamental nature. It has to behave in certain ways that we can at least come to understand and therefore begin to anticipate. We just need to figure it out. It can't possibly have no nature. Don't you see, Richard? Right from the beginning, here you are, trying to figure it out. Don't you suppose that Jagang would know that you will try to figure it out so that you can defeat it? Haven't you done that sort of thing with him in the past? He has figured out your nature, and to counter you, he has created a weapon that, for that very reason, has no nature. You are the seeker. You seek answers to the nature of people or things or situations. To a greater or lesser extent, all people do. Had the blood beast a specific nature, its actions could then be learned and understood. If something can be understood enough to predict its behavior, then precautions can be taken. A plan to counter it can be made. Decoding its nature is essential to effective action being taken. That's why this thing has no nature, so that you can't do those things to stop it. Richard ran his fingers back through his hair. That doesn't make any sense. It's not supposed to. That, too, is part of its trait, to have no trait, to make no sense in order to foil you. I agree with Lord Rao, Kara said. It still has to have some kind of makeup, some way of acting and reacting. Even people who think they are being clever by trying to be unpredictable still fall into patterns even though they may not realize it. This beast can't just run around hither and thither, hoping to come across Lord Rall napping. In order to prevent it from being understood and stopped, this beast was intentionally created as a creature of chaos. It was conjured to attack and kill you, but beyond that mission it functions toward that end through disordered means. Shota gathered up another floating point of her dress as she spoke. Today it attacks with claws, Tomorrow it spits poison. The next day it burns with fire, or crushes with a blow, or sinks fangs into you. It attacks by random action. It does not choose a course of action based on analysis, previous experience, or even the situation at hand. Richard pinched the bridge of his nose as he thought about her explanation. 
so far it seemed like Shota was right in that there had been no pattern to the attacks. They had come in completely different ways, so different, in fact, that they had questioned whether or not it was really the same beast Nietzsche had warned was after him. But Lord Rall has evaded this beast several times now. He has proven that it can be bested. Shota smiled at the very idea, as if a child had come up with the assertion. She strolled off a ways and then returned as she considered the problem. The twitch of her brow told Richard that she had come up with a better way to explain it. Think of the blood beast as if it were rain, she said. Imagine that you want to stay out of the rain, like you would want to avoid being caught by the beast. Imagine that your goal is to stay dry. Today you may be inside when the rain comes, so you remain dry. On another day, the rain may come on the other side of the valley, and you again stay dry. Another day, you leave an area just before the rain begins. Another day, you may decide not to travel, and there the rain visits. Maybe on another day, as you walk down a road, the rain moves in and falls in the field to your right. But on the road and to your left, it remains dry. Each time the random rain event missed you, and you stayed dry sometimes because you took preventative measures, such as staying inside, and sometimes by sheer chance. But as often as it rains, you realize that it will sooner or later get you wet. So you may decide that the best approach in the long run is to gain an understanding of exactly what you are up against. Therefore, in an effort to understand your adversary, you watch the sky, and try to learn to predict the rain. Some patterns begin to reveal themselves as relatively reliable, so you use them as a means of prediction, and as a result, there will be times when you are correct and accurately anticipate the approaching rain. By this means, you are able to stay inside when the rain comes, and thus you stay dry. You have succeeded, it would seem, by applying what you've learned about how to anticipate and predict the rain. Shota's intent, ageless eyes took in Kara and then fixed on Richard with such power that it almost halted his breathing. But sooner or later, she said in a voice that ran a shiver up his spine, the rain will catch you. You may be taken by complete surprise, or you may have forecast that it was coming, but believed that you would have time to be able to take to shelter first and then it suddenly sweeps in faster than you ever thought possible. Or on a day when you are far from shelter, because you thought that on that day there was no chance of rain at all, and so you ventured far from your shelter, it unexpectedly catches you. The result of all these different events is the same. If it is the beast rather than the rain, you are not wet, you are dead. Confidence in your ability to predict the rain will eventually be your downfall, because, while you may be able to accurately predict it on a number of occasions, it is not in reality reliably predictable based on the amount of knowledge actually available to you, or possibly your ability to understand all the information you do have. The more times you escape, though, the stronger your false sense of confidence will become, making you all that much more vulnerable to a surprise event. Your best efforts to know the nature of rain will eventually fail you, because even if you are right with a number of your forecasts, the things that brought about successful predictions are not always relevant. Yet you have no way of knowing that. As a result, the rain will sneak up and envelop you when you are not expecting it. Richard glanced at the worried look on Kara's face, but didn't say anything. The blood beast is like that, Shota said with finality. It has no nature precisely so that you cannot predict its behavior by any patterns to its conduct. Richard took a patient breath. He couldn't keep quiet any longer. But all things that exist have to have a nature to them, laws of their existence, even if we don't understand them. Otherwise, what you are proposing is that they could contradict themselves, and they can't. Lack of understanding on your part does not mean that you can pick an explanation of your choice. 
You can't say that since you don't know the nature of it, it therefore has none. You can say only that you don't yet know the nature of this thing, that you haven't yet been able to understand it. With a slight smile, Shota gestured toward the sky. Like the rain? You may be theoretically correct, Richard, but some things, for all practical purposes, are so far beyond our understanding that they appear to be driven by happenstance, like the rain. For all I know, weather may very well have laws that drive it, but they are so complex and so far-reaching that we cannot realistically hope to comprehend or know them. The rain may not truly, in the end, be an event caused by chance, but it is still outside our ability to predict. So to us the result is the same, as if it were entirely random and without order or nature. A blood beast is like this. If there are in fact laws to its nature as you believe, it would make no difference to you. All I can tell you is that from what I know, it's a beast created specifically to act without order, and the creation of it was successful to the degree that it functions consistently with having no discernible nature, at least none that is of any use in understanding or stopping it. I grant the possibility that you may be right. I suppose it's possible that there is some complex nature behind the beast's seeming disorder. But if that is the case, I can tell you that it is so far beyond our ability to understand that for our purposes it functions by chaos. I'm not sure I understand you, Richard said. Give me an example. For instance, the beast will not learn from what it does. It may try the same failed tactic three times in a row, or it may try something even weaker the next time that obviously has no chance of success. What it does appears random. But if it is driven by some grand, complex equation, it is not revealed through its actions. We see only chaotic results. What's more, it has no consciousness, as we would think of it anyway. It has no soul. While it has a goal, it doesn't care if it succeeds. It doesn't get angry if it fails. It's devoid of mercy, empathy, curiosity, enthusiasm, or worry. It was given a mission, kill Richard Rahl, and it randomly uses its myriad abilities to achieve that goal, but it has no emotional or intellectual interest in seeing its purpose accomplished. Living things have self-interest in seeing themselves succeed at their goals, whether it's a bird flying to a berry bush or a snake following a mouse down a hole. They act to further their life. The blood beast does not. It's just a mindless thing advancing toward the completion of its built-in conjured objective. You might say it's like the rain, given the mission of get Richard wet, the rain tries and tries, a downpour, a drizzle, a quick shower, and all fail. The rain doesn't care that it failed to get you wet. It may idle itself with a drought. It doesn't get eager or angry. It doesn't redouble its efforts. It will just go on raining in different ways until eventually it drenches you. When it does, it will feel no joy. The beast is irrational in that sense. But make no mistake, it is vicious, fierce, and mindlessly cruel in its actions. Richard wearily wiped a hand across his face. Shota, that still makes no sense to me. How could it be like that? If it's a beast, it has to be driven by purpose of some sort. Something has to drive it. Oh, it is driven by something. The need to kill you. It was created to be a creature that acts with pure disorder so that you may not counter it. In a way, you have proven yourself to be an opponent so difficult to defeat that Jagang had to come up with something that would work by avoiding your striking abilities rather than overpowering them. But if it was created to kill me, then it has purpose. Shota shrugged. True enough, but that one bit of information is of no use to you in predicting how, when, or where it will try to kill you. As you should know by now, its actions toward that goal are random. You should clearly see the profound danger in that tactic. If you know the enemy will attack with spears, you can carry a shield. If you know that one assassin with a bow is hunting you, you can have an army search for a man with a bow. If you know a wolf is hunting you, you can set a trap or stay indoors. 
The blood beast has no preferred method of killing or hunting, so from the standpoint of defending yourself from it, it's profoundly difficult to protect against. One day it may attack and easily kill a thousand soldiers who are protecting you. The next time it may timidly withdraw after mauling a single child who toddles in front of you. What it does one time can tell you nothing about what it will do the next time. That too is part of the terror engendered by such a beast, the terror of not knowing how the attack will come. Its strength, its lethality, is that it isn't anything in particular. It isn't strong or weak or fast or slow. It's constantly changing, yet it sometimes stays the same or reverts to a previous state, even an unsuccessful one. The only thing that mattered after it was created was the first time you used your gift. That's when it locked on to you. After that, you can never know what it will do next or when it will do it. You know only that it's coming for you, and no matter how many times you escape its clutches, it will continue to come, maybe several times in the same day, maybe not again for a month or a year, but you can be sure it will eventually come after you again. It will never quit. Richard wondered how much of what Shota was telling him she knew to be fact, and how much she was filling in with what she thought, or maybe even imagined. But you're a witch woman, Kara said. Surely you can tell him something that will help counter it. Part of my ability is the capacity to see how events flow in the river of time, to see where they're going, you might say. Since the blood beast cannot be predicted, it, by that practical definition of its character, exists outside my ability to predict. My ability is linked, in a way, to prophecy. Richard is a man who, in a way, also exists outside prophecy. A man others often find frustratingly unpredictable, as the Mord Sith have no doubt discovered. With this beast, I can offer him no advice about what might happen or what he must avoid. So then, books of prophecy would be of no use? Richard asked. Just as I am blind to it, so is all prophecy. Prophecy cannot see a blood beast any more than it can see any chaotic chance event. Prophecy may be able to say that a person will be shot with an arrow in the morning of a day that it will rain, but prophecy cannot name every day it will rain, or which of those days that it does rain the arrow will precede it. You might say that the most prophecy can predict is that sooner or later it will rain and you will get wet. With his left hand resting on his sword, Richard nodded reluctantly. I have to admit that's close to my own views on prophecy, that it might be able to tell you that the sun will rise tomorrow, but not what you will choose to do with your day. He frowned at her. So, you can tell me nothing about what this blood beast will do because your ability is with the flow of time. When she nodded, he asked, So then how do you seem to know so much about it? The flow of events through the river of time is not my only ability, she said rather cryptically. Richard sighed, not wanting to argue with her. So that's all you can tell me then? Shota nodded. That's all I am able to tell you about the blood beast and what such a thing holds for you. If it continues to exist, sooner or later it will likely get you. But because it's not predictable, even that outcome is not able to be predicted. When, where, or how soon it will get you is impossible to know. It may be today, or for all I know, it may be that before it is able to find you and kill you, you will first die of old age. Well, there is that possibility then, Richard muttered. Not much to lay your hopes on, she said in a sympathetic tone. As long as you live, Richard, as long as blood pumps in your veins, the blood beast will hunt you. Are you suggesting that it finds me by my blood? The way a heart hound is able to be able to find a person by the sound of their beating heart? Shota lifted a hand as if to forestall the notion. Only in a manner of speaking. It has tasted your blood in a sense. But your blood, as you are thinking of it, is not what is meaningful to this beast. What is material is what it sensed from that taste. Your ancestry. 
It already knew that you lived. It was already hunting you. Your use of your gift the first time was enough to bind it to you for all eternity. It is the gift carried in your blood that it sensed and that caused it to change. Richard had so many questions he didn't know what to ask first. He started with what he thought might be the easiest to understand. Why is it linked to the underworld? Is there a purpose for that? A couple that I'm aware of. The underworld is eternal. Time has no meaning in eternity. Therefore, time means nothing to the beast. It will feel no urgency to kill you. Urgency would make it act with a kind of conscious intent that would give it a nature. It feels no pressure with every setting sun to finish the job. One day is the same as the next. The days are never ending. Because it has no sense of time, it needs no nature. Time helps give dimension to every living thing. It allows you to put off chores that you know can be done later. It makes you rush to set up camp before it gets dark. It makes a general act to get his defenses in place before the enemy arrives. It makes a woman want to have children while she still has time. Time is one element that helps shape the nature of everything. Even a moth that emerges from its cocoon to live a life with wings for only a single day must mate in that day and lay eggs, or there will be no more of its kind. The beast is untouched by time. A constituent element of its makeup is the eternity of the underworld, which is antithetical to the very notion of creation, since the underworld is the undoing of creation. That mix, that internal conflict, is part of the driving mechanism which churns its actions and makes it chaotic. When Nietzsche used subtractive magic to eliminate your spent blood, the beast from its roots in the underworld got its taste of you, or more accurately, a measure of your magic. Your blood carries both additive and subtractive magic. The beast was created to be able to know you by your essence, magic, thereby allowing it to transcend typical worldly limits. The beast needed you to use magic the first time so that it could link to you. Through that link, it could hunt you. But when it received that taste of your blood, it became able to know you in a whole different way. The unique element of magic carried in your blood, inherited from Zed's side and from Dark and Rawl's side, is what the beast tasted. That taste is what mutated it from the beast that Jagang's minions created. It's not your blood itself that it senses, but rather it detects those elements of magic inherent in it. That's why any use of magic will draw the beast. That's how it became more dangerous. It now recognizes any use of your magic anywhere in the world. Each person's magic is unique. The beast now knows yours. That's why you must not use your gift. For this very reason, the sisters who brought the beast into existence for Jagang would have loved to have been able to use your blood in the beginning but they had no way of getting any. They could link the beast to your gift, but without your blood it was a weak link that didn't really know the full measure of your magic. Nietzsche gave the beast what it really needed right after it had been awakened by your first use of the gift. She may have done it to save your life, and she may have had no choice, but she did it. Now any use of magic can much more easily bring the blood beast to you it would seem that Nietzsche has, in a way, fulfilled her oath as a sister of the dark. The hair at the back of Richard's neck had lifted. He wanted to think of a way to prove Shota wrong, to find a chink in the armor of the monster she had given shape to in his mind. But the beast has attacked when I wasn't using magic. Just this morning it attacked at our camp. I wasn't using magic. Shota gave him one of those looks that had the power to make him feel hopelessly ignorant. You were using magic this morning. I wasn't, he insisted. I was asleep at the time. How could I be using... Richard's words trailed off. His gaze wandered to the distant hills of the valley and the mountains beyond. He remembered waking up and having that terrible memory of the morning Kalin had disappeared and then realizing that he was holding the hilt of his sword 
its blade drawn halfway from its scabbard, he remembered feeling the sword's stealthy magic coursing through him. But that was the sword's magic, he said. I was holding the sword. It wasn't my magic. It was your magic, Shota insisted. Using the sword of truth calls its power, which joins with your gift, your magic, which is recognized by the blood beast. The sword's magic is part of you now. Using it will chance calling the beast. Richard felt like everything was pressing in on him, closing off every option, shutting off his ability to do anything to stop what was coming for him. He felt the way he had earlier, when he woke up to find himself in an ever-tightening trap. But the sword will help me fight it. I don't know how to use my gift. The sword is the one thing I can count on. It's possible that in some instances it may save you, but because the blood beast has no nature, and because it is now a part of the underworld, there will be times when you think your sword will protect you, and it will not. Thinking you can predict the ability of your sword to work against the beast will beguile you into having false confidence. As I told you, the beast can't be predicted, so there will be times when your sword can't protect you. You must guard not only against false reliance on your sword, but on it unwittingly calling the beast. It's always hunting you, and could attack at any time. But when you use your gift, it vastly increases the ability and therefore the likelihood of the beast initiating an attack. Magic baits it. Richard realized that he was gripping the hilt of the sword so hard in his fist that he could feel the raised letters of the word truth pressing into his palm. He could also feel the sword's anger urgently trying to steal into him to protect him against the threat. He took his hand off the hilt as if it were burning him. He wondered if that magic had ignited his own, if he had just called the blood beast without even realizing what he was doing. Shota clasped her hands. There is something else. Richard's attention returned to the witch woman. Great, what next? Richard, I'm not the one who created this beast. I'm not responsible for its danger to you. She looked away. If you wish to hate me for telling you the truth and want me to stop, then say so, and I will stop. Richard waved an apology. No, I'm sorry. I know it's not your fault. I guess I'm just feeling a bit overwhelmed. Go on. What were you going to say? If you use magic, any magic, the blood beast will know it. Because it acts in a random manner, it very well may not use that magic link to come after you right then. It may inexplicably not respond, but the next time it may pounce. So you dare not gain confidence in that manner. You already told me that. Yes, but as of yet you have not realized the full implications of what I'm telling you. You must understand that any use of magic will give the beast the scent of your blood, so to speak. Like I said, you told me that. That means any use of your gift. When he stared at her with a blank look, she impatiently tapped a finger to his forehead. Think. When he still didn't understand, she said, that includes prophecy. Prophecy? What do you mean? Prophecy is given by wizards who have the gift for prophecy. An ordinary person who reads prophecy will see only words. Even the sisters of the light, guardians of prophecy though they thought they were, do not see prophecy in its true state. You are a war wizard. Being a war wizard merely means that your gift carries a variety of latent abilities. Part of that is that you are able to use prophecy to understand it as it was intended. Do you see? Do you see how easy it is to inadvertently use your gift? It doesn't matter how you use your gift. If you use your sword, or heal with your gift, or call down lightning, it doesn't matter. It will call the beast. To the blood beast, any use of your gift is the same, a means of recognition. It will not distinguish between a small use or a spectacular use. To the beast, the gift is the gift. Richard was incredulous. Do you mean to say that if I simply heal someone or draw my sword, it will alert the beast to me? 
Yes, and likely in short order while it knows precisely where you are. Being that it's elementally subtractive, it exists only partially in this world, so while the beast is not hampered by things such as distance or obstacles, it also doesn't function in this world with ease. It can't fully conceive of the laws of this world such as time. Still, it doesn't get tired. It doesn't get lazy or angry or eager. By all this, I do not mean to suggest that because you use your gift, the beast will therefore act. As I've said, its actions can't be predicted. So like everything else, the use of magic cannot be used as a predictive factor. It only means that it increases its ease in being able to find you. Whether or not it will do so is not knowable. Great, Richard muttered as he went back to pacing. How can he kill it? Kara asked. It isn't alive, Shota said. You can no more kill the blood beast than you can kill a boulder that is about to fall on you, or kill the rain before it has a chance to get you wet. Kara looked as frustrated as Richard felt. Well, there has to be something that it's afraid of. Fear is a function of living things. Maybe then something it doesn't like? Shota frowned. Doesn't like? You know, fire or water or light, something it doesn't like and so avoids. Today it might choose to avoid water. Tomorrow it might slither up from a bog, snatch his leg and drag him under the water to drown him. It moves through this world as it would through an alien landscape that has little effect on it. Where in the world could someone learn how to create such a beast? Richard asked. I believe that the core of the knowledge was discovered by Jagang in ancient books on weapons that originated during the Great War. He is a student of ancient subjects having to do with warfare. He collects such knowledge from all over. I have a suspicion, though, that he took what he found and added specifications he wanted in order to defeat you. We do know that he then used the gifted sisters to spawn the beast. Since they used subtractive magic along with their stolen wizardry, they were able to make use of other gifted people as constituent parts of the beast, ripping their souls from them, ripping away all but what was needed in order to conjure, combine, and create the beast. It is a weapon beyond anything we have ever encountered before. Jagang is the one who caused the beast to be created. He has to be stopped before he creates anything else. I couldn't agree more, Richard muttered. You can't stop him if you are off chasing phantoms, Shota said. Richard halted his pacing and stared at her. Shota, you can't just tell me all this without at least telling me something that will help. You are the one who came to me asking questions. I did not go looking for you. Besides, I have helped you. I told you what I know. Maybe by using the information you now have, you can live another day. Richard had heard enough. The blood beast had no nature, but not to have a nature in a way was its nature. So it had one as far as he was concerned. It may be true, as Shota had said, that there was no accurate way to predict what it would do next, but lack of understanding or knowledge did not constitute a lack of nature. It was, however, a point that was not worth arguing, he thought that it might be an important distinction sooner or later, but right then it didn't matter much. Everything Shota had said largely confirmed what Nietzsche had already reported. While she had added facets and details that Nietzsche hadn't known about, Shota hadn't provided any solutions. In fact, it seemed to him that she had gone to a great deal of trouble to make sure she had painted a hopeless picture. Richard almost rested his hand on his sword, he stopped and ran his fingers through his hair instead. He was at his wit's end. He turned and stared off at the trees spread across the valley, their leaves shimmering in the late day sun. So there is nothing I can do to protect myself from the blood beast? I didn't say that. Richard spun back around. What? You mean there is a way? Without emotion, Shota studied his eyes. I believe that there is one way to keep you alive. What way? She clasped her hands, twining her fingers together. She looked down at the ground a moment as if considering, and then met his gaze with steady resolution. 
You could stay here. He saw Samuel come to his feet. Richard returned his attention to Shota's waiting gaze. What do you mean I could stay here? She shrugged as if it were a trivial offer. Stay here and I will protect you. Kara straightened, her arms coming unfolded. You can do that? I believe I can. Then come with us, Kara suggested. That would solve the problem. Richard already didn't like Kara's idea. I can't, Shota said. I can only protect him if he stays here in this valley, in my home. I can't stay, Richard said, trying to make it sound casual. Shota reached out and gently grasped his arm, not allowing him to so easily dismiss the issue. You can, Richard. Would it be so bad staying with me? I didn't mean it that way. Then stay here with me. For how long? Her fingers tightened ever so slightly, as if she feared to say it, feared his reaction, but at the same time was steadfast in her course. Forever. Richard swallowed. He felt like he'd walked out onto thin ice without realizing it, and now he found that it was a long, long way back to safety. He knew that if he said the wrong thing, he would be in over his head. His flesh tingled as he realized how dangerous the late-day air had suddenly become. At that moment, he wasn't sure that he wouldn't rather face the beast than Shota's scrutiny. Richard spread his arms as if to ask her understanding. Shota, how can I stay here? You know that there are people counting on me, people who need me. You said so yourself. You are not the slave to others chained to them by their need. It's your life, Richard. Stay and have a life. Kara, looking more than suspicious, tapped a thumb to her own chest. And what about me? Without looking over at Kara, without taking her gaze from Richard's, Shota said, One woman in this place is enough. Kara glanced between Richard and Shota as they stared into each other's eyes. But she then did what Richard had earlier advised. She turned cautious and said nothing. Stay, Shota whispered intimately. Richard could see a terrible kind of vulnerability laid bare in Shota's eyes, in her hungering expression, an open look he had never seen on her before. From the corner of his eye, he could also see Samuel glaring at him. Richard tipped his head, indicating her companion. And what about him? She did not shy from the question. In fact, she seemed to have expected it. One seeker in this place is enough. Shota, stay, Richard, she pressed, cutting him off before he could turn her down, before he crossed a line he hadn't known was there until right then. It was both an offer and an ultimatum. But what about the blood beast? You said yourself that you can't know its nature. How can you know that you would be safe here if I stayed? A lot of men near me were killed when the beast attacked the first time. Shota lifted her chin. I know myself, know my abilities, my limits. I believe that I can keep you safe here in this valley. I can't be completely certain, but I sincerely believe it to be true. I do know that if you leave here, you will have no protection. This is your only chance. He knew that the last part had more than one meaning. Stay, Richard, please. Stay here with me. Forever. Her eyes brimmed with tears. Yes, forever. Please, stay. I will take care of you forever. I will make sure you never regret it or ever miss the rest of the world. Please. This was not Shota, the witch woman. This was simply the woman, Shota, desperately laying herself open to him in a way she never had, offering her unprotected heart, taking a chance, the naked loneliness he saw there was terrifying. He knew because he felt the same anguish of being so alone that it hurt. Richard swallowed and took the step out onto the ice. Shota, that's probably the kindest thing you've ever said to me. To know that you respect me enough to ask such a thing means more to me than you will ever understand. I have more respect for you than you know. That's why when I needed answers, I thought of no one but you. 
I sincerely appreciate all you are offering, but I'm afraid I can't accept. I have to go. The look that came to her face made Richard go as cold as if he'd been plunged into icy water. Without another word, Shota turned and started away. Chapter 42 Richard caught Shota's arm, stopping her before she could leave. He couldn't allow it to end in this way, for more than one reason. Shota, I'm sorry, but you said it yourself. It's my life to live. If you consider me even a little to be your friend, someone you really do care about, then you would want me to live my life as I think I must, not as you might wish I could. Her chest heaved. Fine. You have made your choice, Richard. Leave. Go and live what is left of your life. I came to you because I need your help. She turned around fully toward him and cast him as forbidding a look as he had ever seen on anyone. It was the unmistakable mask of a witch woman. He could almost see the air around her sizzling. I have given you help, gained through an effort on my part that I seriously doubt you can begin to imagine. Use that help as you wish. Now. Leave my home. As much as he wanted right then to do as she asked, as much as he wanted not to press her, he had come for a reason and she had not yet addressed it. He wasn't leaving until she did. I need your help to find Kalen. Her look turned even colder. If you are wise, you will use the knowledge I have given you to stay alive as long as you can, to help to defeat Jagang, or to go chasing after phantoms. I don't care which anymore. Just go, before you find out why wizards fear to come into my home. You said that your ability helps you see events in the flow of time. What does your ability see about me in the future? Shota was silent for a moment before she finally glanced away from his steady gaze. For some reason, the river of time has become obscured to me. It happens. Her gaze returned, more determined than ever. You see, I can be of no further help. Now go. He was determined not to allow her to dodge the issue. You know that I came here for information, for something that could help me find out the truth about what's going on. This is important. It's important to more people than just you or me. Don't close yourself off from me like this, Shota, please. I need your help. She arched an eyebrow. Since when have you ever followed anything I've ever told you? Look, I admit that in the past I haven't always agreed with everything you've had to say, but I wouldn't be here if I didn't think you were an astute woman. While some of the things you've told me in the past were true, if I would have done things strictly your way without using my own judgment as the situation developed, I would have failed, and we would all be either under the rule of Dark and Rawl or in the merciless embrace of the Keeper of the Underworld. So you say. Richard lost his indulgent tone as he leaned toward her. You do remember the time you came to see me at the Mud People's Village, don't you? The time you begged me to close the veil so that the Keeper wouldn't have us all? You do remember telling me how much the Keeper wanted those with the gift, wanted you, a witch woman, to suffer unimaginably for all eternity? He jabbed her with a finger, punctuating his points. You did not suffer all the frightful things necessary to stop what was happening. I did. You did not have to fight the Keeper's terrors to close the veil. I did. You did not save your own hide from the Keeper. I did. She was watching him from under her lowered brow. I remember. I succeeded. I saved you from that fate. You saved yourself from that fate. That it saved me as well was not your purpose merely a side consequence. He let out a breath, trying to be patient. Shota, I know that you must know something about this, something about what's happened to Kalin. I told you I don't remember any woman named Kalin. Yes, and the reason is that something is terribly wrong, and I realize that because of that, you don't recall her, but you must know something that will help me in my search for the truth some bit of information that will help me find out the truth about what's really going on. 
And you expect that you can just walk uninvited into my home, put my life at risk, do your little dance, and get whatever part of my life, my abilities, that you want for yourself. Richard stared at her. She had not denied that she knew something that might help him. He realized that he had indeed been right about her. Show to stop posturing and stop acting like I'm unfairly making demands of you. I've never lied to you and you know it. I'm telling you that this is important to you too, whether or not you yet realize it. For all I know, it could yet be something the Keeper has initiated in order to get us all. I need whatever information you can give me to prevent the success of whatever it is that's going wrong. I'm not playing games. I will have what you know. And you think that such a demand entitles you to it? Her eyes narrowed. You think that just because I have something, your perceived need means that I must surrender whatever I have? That you are entitled to any part of my life you feel you need? You think that my life is not mine, but I am merely meant to serve you? You think my life means nothing but to be at your disposal when you deign to have use of me? You think you can come in here and make demands, but when I dare ask for something, you get indignant. I wasn't indignant, he said, trying to restrain his tone. I appreciated the sincerity of your offer. I understand very well the empty feeling of being alone. But if you're the woman I believe you are, you wouldn't want me even though my heart wasn't in it. You deserve to have someone who can love you. I'm sorry, Shota, but I can't lie and tell you that I can be that one for you, or I would only in the end be hurting you worse. I can't lie to you. I'm already in love with someone. And even if you already realized that, would you really want someone who was so casually unfaithful as to just take up such an offer on the spot? I think what you really want is your equal, a true partner in your life, someone with whom to share the wonders of life. I don't think you really want the empty reward of a lapdog. I think you already know that a lapdog can bring you no real joy. If you care about me, if you made such an offer because you really care, if you were sincere, then help me. She didn't look like she intended to answer, so he pressed on. Shota, I need to know any information you can give me. It's important, as important as it was to you when you came to ask me to seal the breach in the veil. I don't know enough to solve this problem. If I fail, I fear we all will lose. I don't have time for games. I need the information you have. How dare you make such an arrogant demand of me? I've already told you, already given you my answer. It's my ability, my life. You have no right to it. Richard pressed his thumb and middle finger to opposite temples as he took a calming breath. He grudgingly realized that maybe she had a point. He turned his back to her and walked off a few paces as he considered what he might do. One thing he knew for certain, he wasn't leaving without every bit of help available. You're saying then that you know something that would help me in my search for the truth. I know a lot of things about a lot of different areas of the truth. But you know something that I need in order to find the truth about what brought me here to see you. Yes, he knew it. With his back still to her, he said, Name your price. You would not be willing to pay the price. He considered the price he expected her to revisit. Richard turned to her. She was watching him in that way that made him feel transparent. He was not leaving without the information, and that was all there was to it. This was Kalin's life. Whatever he had to do to save her life, including giving up his, he would do. Name your price. The Sword of Truth. The world seemed to stop. What? You ask the price for what I can tell you. The price is the Sword of Truth. Richard stood paralyzed. You can't be serious. The corners of her lips curled ever so slightly. Oh, but I am. Off through the trees, Richard saw Samuel stand up, suddenly very attentive. What do you want with the sword? 
You asked the price, I named it. What I want with the payment after it has been made is not your concern. Richard felt sweat trickle down between his shoulder blades. Shota. He couldn't seem to make himself move or speak. This was not at all what he had expected. Shota turned her back and started for the road. Goodbye, Richard. It's been nice knowing you. Don't come back. Wait. Shota paused to look back over her shoulder, waves of her auburn hair glistening in a streamer of golden sunlight. Yes or no, Richard? I have given you enough of myself for nothing in return. I will give you no more. If you want this, you will pay for it. I will not offer you the chance again. She watched him a moment and then started to turn away again. Richard gritted his teeth. All right. She paused. You agree then? Yes. She turned fully around to face him, waiting. Richard immediately reached up to pull the baldric off over his head. Kara jumped in front of him and seized his wrist in both her hands. What do you think you're doing? She growled. Her red leather glowed in the low sunlight as if to match the fire in her eyes. Shota knows something about this whole mess, he told her. I need to know what she can tell me. I don't know what else to do. I don't have any choice. <laughs>